God resides only in the hopes and purposes and hearts of men. The promises of God are that He will dwell within the innermost efforts and springs of men. The task of the building goes on all the time. It is never completed. Only thus can the aspirations of mankind find in God and the Bible their chief cornerstone and true bedrock. Welcome to From the Quarries. Tonight's video, The Scriptures and Royal Arch Ritual, was written by Everett R. Turnbull and Ray V. Denslow and comes from the History of Royal Arch Masonry, Volume 1. I hope you enjoy it. Good evening and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic Law. The stone which the builders refused is become the head of the corner. Did you never read in scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the headstone of the corner? Several variations of the same theme are used in the chapter ritual. They incorporate the quotations from various parts of the Bible, Old Testament and New. All the verses together emphasize how central the thought is. Difficult as it may be to indicate in English, we should recognize that all the variant verses trace to one source, to the Hebrew of Psalms 118. The impression that the original gives is something jubilant, ever triumphant. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of God. Open to me the gates of righteousness. The stone which the builders refused is become the chief cornerstone. English readers have sometimes suggested that the cornerstone assumes merely a decorative and ornamental place in the building. Hebrew tradition looked on the cornerstone as strategic, fundamental and cohesive to the structure. In the realm of personal experience, for each one of us, thought gives a special place to the cornerstone. The idea of rejection and of later acceptance has happened to everyone. Ideas that we refuse to entertain and concepts that we have rejected may have the power to return and to command our fullest respect and loyalty. Sentiment that we ignored or brushed aside may have within it the seeds of renewal. What made no appeal to a person may even be revived for him more strongly as the bulwark he respects. An event or piece of work that won only passing attention may hold within itself the decisive dominion of returning to faith. King Lear found that he could have a home only with the daughter he had disinherited. In the process of inner growth, we may come to rely heavily with true dependence upon those very ideas or people whom we had ourselves dismissed and cast aside. In every work of genius, Gemma Emerson suggested, we recognize our own rejected thought. Archaeology has unearthed many examples of tools and utensils discarded by changing styles, but later readapted and copied as models to serve the needs of another generation. Works of art, bits of beauty, household remedies, which seem out of date and have been tossed aside, may easily, under other circumstances, make us rely on them with utter dependence. Loyalties, memberships, ideas that we took lightly may become trusted bedrock. What we argued against as unfit for use may loom significant for us under changed perspective. Glibly and in an offhand way, we may be ready to say, heave it among the rubbish, only later to discover how many worthwhile and significant things 
have been retrieved from the rubbish heap and restored to places of honour and usefulness. For example, have you not known those who debated heatedly against Freemasonry and other good causes show a change of heart and serve the fraternity with ardour? Very often such things as loyal principles and reputations and sentiments, trusted friends and warm associations, health and citizenship are examples of what people, our own friends, even you and I, have grown to value and appreciate fully, only after we have neglected and ignored. Yes, indeed, it is an important lesson that Royal Arch Masonry emphasises, that the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So it is also of social legislation and once radical ideas, such as the care of the sick and of the aged, that which was kicked aside and repudiated later established its real value. Kick aside religion, try to forget the Bible, and some day you may live to return to them. We lose the master name and forget it, and then we spend our days and effort to retrieve what we have lost. In a deep sense, thought often means that we shall be reinvested with that we too easily gave away. Perhaps more than any single agency, Freemasonry in general, and Royal Archmasonry in particular, keep alive the knowledge and study of the English Bible. This represents one of the greatest contributions of the fraternity. To a generation which has, in large measure, forgotten the habit of regular Bible reading, Freemasonry makes the Bible its chief reliance. Close attention to the ritual and the Bible passages quoted can equip one with considerable knowledge and familiarity with the Bible. Chiefly, three books have contributed heavily to the Royal Arch ritual. Those parts which deal with the construction of the tabernacle, as given in Exodus, 1 Kings and Ezekiel, and the parallel passages in Chronicles. Everywhere in Masonic symbolism we find the Book of Law and its principal inspiration, and especially from those parts of the book which are not widely read. The aprons, with sash or girdle to hold close to the body, have been traced by scholars to Exodus 28 and the vestments of the High Priest. The breastplate of twelve precious stones arranged in four rows is described in the same chapter. Likewise, the jewels of the officers may be traced to the ornamental chains or necklaces with bells and pomegranates and rings described in that chapter. That no shoes are mentioned there may explain customs in the early degrees. Even the colour scheme of the Blue Lodge and upper bodies and the veils in the Royal Arch find their origin in the curtains and hanging of the same section of Exodus. The Blue Lodge takes its name and colour from the indigo blue of the temple as its most prominent colour, and next in order is the crimson red. Nowhere in the temple was the colour green mentioned, and green is not included in the earlier degrees. Tyrian purple and scarlet were the colours of royalty in the Bible and have become respected Masonic colours. Our sprig of acacia has been identified with scholars with the shittim wood used in the making of the tabernacle. From the first book of Kings and the companion chapter in Chronicles, we have the prayer of King Solomon at the dedication of the first temple, in which Hiram Abiff assisted. These two books supply us with the names of Cyrus and Zedekiah and much of our ritualistic work. The mention of the tribe of Judah derives from this section. Boaz and Jarkin are mentioned in 1 Kings 7 verse 21, and Adoniram is named in 1 Kings chapter 4. The prophet Ezekiel is the source of the lesson on the gate which is shut and is not to be opened, and gives us the counsel to mark well. 
The English of the King James Version, to which Freemasonry is committed, does not make clear that we have a favourite expression of the prophet Ezekiel. In the original Hebrew, Ezekiel uses the same idiom, but the English translations do not indicate this in such passages as Son of man, behold with thine eyes and hear with thine ears, and set thine heart upon all that I shall show thee. With the Lord said unto me, Son of man, mark well, and behold with thine eyes and hear with thine ears all that I say unto thee. And frequently Ezekiel speaks of set thy face. We shall return to some of these references later. The word rod is well known in the chapter ritual, and again, the English does not suggest how many different readings and associations there are for this in the Hebrew. This single word, rod, can add considerably to our real knowledge of the Bible. Jacob, in Genesis 30, used a rod of poplar in his cattle breeding. The shepherd's psalm tells of Shevet, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Moses and Aaron in Exodus used a matter as a rod from the shittim or acacia wood. This was the rod that became a serpent in the presence of Pharaoh and otherwise served Moses as a rod of authority and the instrument by which on two separate occasions he sought to gain water from the rock. The rod of Aaron blossomed as is described in Numbers 17 and is similar to the rod dropped before the veils or later found in the Ark of the Covenant. The prophet Ezekiel uses the same word, rod or matter, in chapter 7 verse 10. The morning is gone forth, the rod hath blossomed, pride hath budded, violence is risen to a rod of wickedness. Jonathan, in 1 Samuel chapter 14 verse 21, used a matter rod to help himself to some honey. Most of the references to rods come from the book of Exodus. This book also furnishes us with the episode which was the turning point in the life of Moses, the burning bush, and the discovery of God as, I am that I am. All the references to manna, to the pot of incense in the, in the ark, the portable ark of the covenant carried on staves and its contents, come from Exodus and some parallels in Numbers. The sons of Noah were, according to Genesis chapter 6, Shem, Ham and Japheth. Rabboni means most excellent master, as schoolmaster and head of academy who raises up many disciples. Only one verse comes from the prophet Isaiah, from chapter 42 verse 16 to lead the blind by a way they know not. Passages in the ritual are quoted from the prophet Haggai, from the prophet Amos, from Zechariah, Psalms 122 and 23, and Deuteronomy. The Levites were instructed to bear the Ark of the Covenant, which was to contain the book. A curious misinterpretation involves a related verse in chapter 29 verse 4, which has for us very close associations with Exodus and Ezekiel. The King James Version reads, Yet the Lord hath not given an heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear unto this day. In the Hebrew, the intent and meaning is quite different, and should be represented in English as, not until this day, as it were, did God give you heart to understand, and eyes to see, and ears to hear. That is, only now did you notice, and pay attention, and mark well, and begin to understand. This accords with the teachings of Royal Archmasonry, that we should not be thoughtless, but that we should take heed and appreciate fully the singular form and beauty of people and places and ideas. 
Three books have contributed most from the Bible to royal arch ritual. The Book of Exodus and 1 Kings and Ezekiel in their chapters on the construction of the temple. One verse runs through these books as refrain, using the same words in Hebrew with important emphasis. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Exodus 25 verse 8. In 1 Kings 6.13 we read, And I shall dwell among the children of Israel, and will not forsake my people Israel. Then Ezekiel, in that chapter where he speaks of coming by way of the east gate, and even distressed by some of the things he saw, adds in chapter 23 verse 9, And I will dwell in the midst of them forever. An important aside which will help in the understanding. The question has been asked, why did the Hebrews have to call upon the people of Tyre for help in constructing the temple? Why were the Hebrews so deficient in the building trades? The customary answer given is that the people of Israel were forbidden by the commandments to make any manner of likeness of anything in heaven or earth and thus prevented the development of the plastic and building arts. To that answer, I disagree. Instead, the intent and effect of that second commandment on the Hebrew, forbidding the likeness of anything, was a constant reminder that the noblest emotions and highest ideals of life cannot be expressed in any art form. Not even in speech can the full idea be given. That is the point of the Hebrew, and its constant interpretation of the three verses in Exodus, Kings and Ezekiel. God does not reside in the structure. We cannot localize God within a building. We, together, will build. God resides only in the hopes and purposes and hearts of men. The promises of God are that he will dwell within the innermost efforts and springs of men. The task of the building goes on all the time. It is never completed. Only thus can the aspirations of mankind find in God and the Bible their chief cornerstone and true bedrock. Welcome to From the Quarries. Tonight's video, Why the Royal Arch, gives a lot of the what as well as the why of the Royal Arch chapter, and provides clear advice to those who may be thinking of taking the step into Royal Arch Freemasonry. It is divided into eight sections. An introduction, the pattern of Freemasonry, the emergence of the Royal Arch, the contentious position of the Royal Arch, an integral part of Freemasonry, passing the chair, that which was lost, and the question of entry. It was written by Roy A. Wells and first presented in 1989. I hope you enjoy it. Good evening and welcome to tonight's presentation From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic Law. This paper is addressed to brethren to whom the Royal Arch is an obscurity, or to whom this part of Freemasonry has been misrepresented as an extraneous degree, and one in which they need not be greatly concerned. Master Masons are continually arriving at the point when they ask, why the Royal Arch? What has it to do with the craft? And it has to be recognised that their Masonic development is either encouraged or arrested 
according to the nature of the reply that is given. If the questions are raised with those who are fully enlightened, the brother will benefit from the proper guidance and instruction. But too often they will be addressed to brethren who are not competent to answer adequately, and that limitation could have adverse influence for all time upon one who might well have found an inspired fulfilment in the royal arch, or maybe a path in that direction. A short answer to those questions could be, the royal arch is a completion of the third degree. But that is an understatement. The royal arch is certainly a natural progression in Freemasonry, in that it provides genuine secrets following substituted ones that had been granted earlier on. And in that role, it forms an integral part of English Freemasonry, or of where it is based upon similar lines. Freemasonry, basically, is a biblical exercise concerning itself with the rise and fall of successive temples at Jerusalem. The one built by Solomon was the first fixed place of worship of the God of Israel, and was inspired by the pronouncement to King David, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom for ever. It was intended to be the permanent resting place of the Ark of the Covenant, which had been brought into being by Moses after the commencement of the wandering in the wilderness following the exodus from Egypt. Biblical history informs us that shortly before King Solomon died, a rebellion occurred, which eventually resulted in the twelve tribes being split into two kingdoms. Israel in the north, composed of ten tribes, with the capital in Samaria, and the remaining two tribes forming the kingdom of Judah, with their capital in Jerusalem. The northern kingdom disappeared from history after it had been conquered by Sargon, king of Assyria, and whose members had not been taken into captivity, merged with the surrounding nations. Judah, however, retained its identity, first as a tributary kingdom under the dominion of Egypt, and later, in a similar capacity, under Babylon. Following a default in payment of the tribute, the city of Jerusalem and the house for my name were both destroyed by the forces of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Jehoiakim, the tributary king of Judah, and all likely leaders of people, together with their families, were taken into exile, thus preventing any form of leadership for the peasants who were left behind. During the period of exile in Babylon, Judah survived as a religious community, and when Babylon fell to the Persian conquerors under Cyrus, they were encouraged to return to Jerusalem to rebuild their city and the Holy Temple. The Royal Arch has two themes, one dated before the exile in Babylon, dealing with the finding of a scroll of the scriptures when repairs were being carried out in the temple, and the other, which has a recovery theme, in a sequence of events when the Jews returned from Babylon to build the second temple, which is the one used in the English system. From the writings of the prophet Haggai, we learn that the second temple was not to be compared with the first one. But in his report, The glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of the former, and in this place I will give peace, implied that the material splendor of Solomon's temple would be replaced by a spiritual development, resulting in a more exalted idea of the God of Israel. But it was not to be. The craft and the royal arch in conjunction span the whole period of the Old Testament, dealing with the first and second temples in their entirety, continuing to the 70th year of the Christian era when the destruction was repeated, this time by the forces of Rome under Titus. The Pattern of Freemasonry If it were possible to summarize the teachings of the three degrees in a few words, in order to appreciate the parts played by each in relation to the Royal Arch, it might well be said, A. The first degree emphasizes the primary necessity for a complete faith in the Supreme Being, the Father of all, who permits entrance to mortal existence. In it, 
we learn the duty that we owe our neighbour in his time of need. B. The second degree stresses the duty we owe to ourselves, fully to develop our talents and skills in the arts and sciences, and thus to play a useful part in life. And C. The third degree provides an opportunity to contemplate the closing hour of existence, however untimely that may appear to be for some of our brethren and colleagues. Thus we have an obvious sequence of birth, maturity and death. But to what purpose? If the word has been lost for succeeding generations, are they to be left with the blank finality of death and no more? Alternatively, does the expression until time or circumstances restore the genuine begin to take on new meaning? The Royal Arch embraces the whole program and illustrates in a most colourful setting that divine and human affairs are indeed interwoven throughout all these stages and afterwards. It helps us to widen our knowledge to a full appreciation of the nature and the work of the Almighty, and leads to an understanding that the soul, or spirit, will return to the Father who gave it life. The loss and recovery theme is completed by the Royal Arch, and so, in that sense, it is a completion of the third degree. It is the conclusion of an exercise. That it has become severed from the craft may even be deemed an advantage for its members. The separation tends to ensure that the light which it contained is shed upon those who came to it properly prepared. That is to say, with an understanding that among the favours that are given or received in the craft, not least is an opportunity to increase our spiritual philosophy in an area where humility and contrition are demonstrated as clear indications of merit. The Emergence of the Royal Arch The well-defined ceremonies in the craft as we have them today are the result of evolution and changes that have occurred since the beginning of the 18th century. The form of the three-degree system in the craft cannot be dated much before 1724, having been developed from a two-degree plan. Masonic students feel that the actual ceremonial was simple, but a catechetical program for the purpose of instruction developed in a social setting. Much of what was contained in that form was later moulded into scenario. The most common reference for the Royal Arch has been from Dr. Fifield Dassigny's book, A Serious and Impartial Inquiry into the Cause of the Present Day Decay of Freemasonry in the Kingdom of Ireland, which was published in 1744. It is clear that the Royal Arch was well established by that date, although not freely available, as the following extract will show. Some of the fraternity have expressed their uneasiness at the Royal Arch being kept a secret from them, since they had already passed through the usual degrees of probation. But I cannot help being of the opinion that they have no right to, to any such benefit until they make a formality as having passed the chair and given undeniable proofs of their skill. Here we have evidence that the Royal Arch was reserved as a step beyond that of Master, or in the writer's view, should be kept as such. However, it is worth bearing in mind that even today, the Master is referred to as an experienced craftsman chosen to preside over the, lo the Lodge. Dassigny's report makes it plain that the Brethren in Ireland, at that time, were agitating for an easier entry to the Royal Arch, for it was certainly not, as it is today, available for a Master Mason of four weeks and upwards. The Contentious Position of the Royal Arch When the four old lodges in London set themselves up as a Grand Lodge in 1717, they did not represent the total of lodges in London and Westminster by any means and they had no intention of imposing jurisdiction outside those boundaries. The establishment soon made itself felt, 
and its role of lodges grew quite rapidly. Laws and regulations came into being, and in 1723 the first book of constitutions was published. The organisation attracted broadsheets against itself, and so-called exposures of rituals were circulated. It was from one of those, Pritchard's Masonry Dissected, published in 1730, that we have the earliest evidence of the Hiramic legend, which was then prated, printed in narrative form. Because of the amount of material that had been, been available in such publications, the Premier Grand Lodge made certain changes in the conduct of ceremonial in order to detect and then reject Freemasons who had been irregularly made in the various clandestine lodges that had sprung into existence. The changes they made were unacceptable to those brethren who had remained independent from the Grand Lodge throughout that period. In due course, initiative was taken by some Irish immigrant Freemasons, whose employment as artisans accounted for their appearance in this country. And in 1751, a committee was organised for the purpose of bringing together those who were anxious to preserve former traditions. That committee developed into a second Grand Lodge, styling itself the most ancient and honourable society of free and accepted Masons, and became known as the Ancients. They practiced ceremonials that had progressed to include the master's part, the installation of master, with the royal arch degree to follow, all work under the authority of the warrant of the lodge. So firmly was it established that Lawrence Dermot, their Grand Secretary, described the system thus. Ancient masonry consists of four degrees, the first of which are that of apprentice and the fellow craft, and the sublime degree of the master, and a brother, being well versed in these degrees and otherwise qualified, as hereafter will be expressed as eligible to be admitted to the fourth degree, the holy royal arch. This degree is certainly more august, sublime and important than those which precede it, and it is the summit and perfection of ancient masonry. It inspires in our minds a more firm belief of the existence of a supreme deity without beginning of days or end of years, and justly reminds us of the respect and veneration due to that holy name. And he also said, The royal arch I believe to be the root, heart and marrow of masonry. The attitude of the Premier Grand Lodge, however, was vastly different, and we need take only one incident to illustrate this. In 1759, a brother from Ireland applied to them for relief, and it is thought, sought to strengthen his claim by stating he was a Royal Archmason. Samuel Spencer, the Grand Secretary, gave this as his reply. Your being an ancient mason, you are not entitled to any of our charity. The ancient masons have a lodge at the Five Bells in the Strand, and their secretary's name is Dermot. Our society is neither arch, royal arch, or ancient, so that you have no right to partake of our charity. Within a few years, many members of modern lodges, having visited ancients' lodges, and developed an interest in the Royal Arch and its ceremonial, set up meetings of their own. Lord Blaney, Grand Master, was exalted in the one held at the Turk's Head, Gerald Street, Soho, but still the non-recognition continued. Despite his statement a few years earlier, Samuel Spencer, the Grand Secretary, was also exalted in the Royal Arch, and is on record as having visited the chapter at the Turk's Head. Whilst firmly rejecting the Royal Arch in their official capacity, Grand Officers of the Premier Grand Lodge also appreciated the convenience of wearing two hats. Under a Charter of Compact, granted by Lord Blaney in 1766, a separate admission was created for this one degree, and thus an atmosphere of respectability was produced. Nevertheless, 
the Royal Arch was not to be officially recognised for another 50 years. For the ancients, the administration of the Royal Arch was by a committee of those in their Grand Lodge who were duly qualified. Later on, influenced by the rise of the modern's Grand, Lo Grand Chapter, they called that committee a Grand Chapter, but its work remained unchanged, as the Royal Arch was still a fourth degree, conferred under the authority of a Lodge Warrant and within the overall framework of a Craft Lodge. An Integral Part of Freemasonry when the two Grand Lodges united in 1813, the document setting out the terms agreed by both was called the Act of Union, and it contained the following item. It is declared and pronounced that pure ancient masonry consists of three degrees and no more, viz. those of Entered Apprentice, the Fellow Craft, and the Master Mason, including the Supreme Order of the Holy Royal Arch but this article is not intended to prevent any lodge or chapter from holding a meeting in any of the degrees of the Order of Chivalry, according to the constitutions of the said orders. The first part of that item is reprinted in the preliminary declaration in the Book of Constitutions, a copy of which is presented to each brother following his initiation. In all probability, that statement inspired the explanation given to a companion at the conclusion of his exaltation ceremony. You may perhaps imagine that you have this day taken a fourth degree in Freemasonry. However, it is not the case. It is the Master Masons completed. An interesting regulation governing ancient chapters appeared in 1807. No chapter shall act without the Charter of Constitution from a Grand Chapter, which is to be specially entrusted to each first principal at his installation, to be held by him in safe custody on behalf of Grand Chapter. The first principal shall produce it at every convocation of the chapter. However, an unresolved difficulty still exists, because in the wording of the charter, there is an injunction that it is to be held with and attached to the warrant of the lodge. To find an instance where the Warrant of the Lodge and the Charter of the Chapter are attached would be quite a challenge, indeed, extremely unlikely. The only possibility of both being in possession of one person would be if a past master of the Lodge were to be installed for a second time and whilst occupying the First Principal's chair. Chapters do not, of necessity, carry the same name as the Lodge to which they are attached but they do take the same number. Unlike the list of lodges where seniority has been determined by number, this cannot be applied to chapters. Chapters cannot come into existence except through a resolution and petition from members of a lodge. Passing the Chair As we have seen, in the early period, only those who had occupied the chair of a lodge could be exalted to the Royal Arch. In those days, election for mastership was held every six months, from one St. John's Day to the next, i.e. St. John the Baptist on 24th of June, or St. John the Evangelist on 27th of December. In some lodges, however, the chair remained almost the prerogative of one brother. To avoid an inevitable decay through the lack of qualified candidates for the Royal Arch, a modified form of installation, minus certain details, was introduced to enable brethren who had not been in the chair to enter. This process created virtual masters, and by such means they were past the chair without having to rule over a lodge. Subsequently, amendments were made that permitted master masons of 12 months standing to enter. That which was lost. The stated intention in opening a Master Mason's Lodge is to seek that which was lost, but there is always the admission of failure in the closing. The substituted secrets that are regularly communicated are declared to be sanctioned and confirmed until time or circumstance shall restore the genuine. Until what time and in what circumstances? 
Many brethren have pondered upon the reply given to certain ruffians that without consent and cooperation of two colleagues, neither he could nor would divulge the details demanded, but that patience and industry would in due time entitle the worthy Mason to a participation in them. When is due time, and how does one become a worthy Mason in this respect? The attempt to obtain the proper secrets without due title to them, or, as we would term it today, the attempt to get something for nothing, must lead to tragedy of a sort for somebody. The third degree has proved to be a breaking off point for many brethren, who find ample fulfilment in lodge affairs. It has been a convenient halt for many reasons, and in, the same, in some cases, a proper one. The enrichment and reward for the truly speculative Mason is, is determined entirely by the limit of his own capacity or ability. For him, the Royal Arch is yet another storehouse that awaits. The Question of Entry Whether or not to enter the Royal Arch is a question that each brother must answer for himself, but surely he is entitled to know something of the subject beforehand. His attention should be directed to that excellent publication by Bernard Jones, Freemason's Book of the Royal Arch, which is so informative, a useful book of reference and very easy reading. A brother does not have to make the first approach himself. He may be invited to join. It seems proper that Royal Arch members should be entitled to choose their companions. When a candidate for Freemasonry first appears, he affirms that his trust is placed in God, that he has a genuine desire for knowledge, and a sincere wish to render himself more extensively serviceable to his fellow creatures. When he appears in a chapter, it is with the desire of improving in Freemasonry and directing that improvement to the glory of God and the good of man. Such a desire to improve can only arise if his interest in Freemasonry thus far has been carefully tended and fostered by those upon whom such responsibility rests, including his proposer, his seconder, the officers of the lodge, all those whose duty to him is so obvious that it so easily gets overlooked. If the lodge of instruction is just a lodge of rehearsal, without the leavening of Masonic instruction, then ritual becomes the focal point and dominates all other aspects of Freemasonry, and the brethren can become affected by this. If the lodge business has nothing but successive ceremonies, it becomes a stage for ritual prowess and word perfection. We all accept that Freemasonry is a system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols, and that alone calls for some effort to understand not only that the rich, what the ritual says, but what it sets out to do. It certainly provides the tools, but the application rests entirely with ourselves. The building of a temple within ourselves commences when we begin to understand exactly what is veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. The search for that which was lost began after Adam fell from favour and bequeathed to mankind that everlasting quest, for in every age there is that fall from grace. The building of the first temple at Jerusalem was an ideal subject for the builders in stone to moralise upon. Not so much for the details of its construction, but for the purposes of its construction. A house for my name, reverence to the Almighty. Biblical history records the fall from grace leading, leading to the destruction of that temple and the loss of the word. The legend that is built into the craft conveys the principle of a loss which, in turn, is complemented by a recovery theme set into the royal arch. It is that ceremonial which has been aptly described as the very essence of Freemasonry from as long ago as 1756 by Lawrence Dermott. In conclusion, I can think of no worse condemnation for any senior Freemason than that he should hear the plea from a junior brother, 
Why doesn't somebody tell me these things? And then fails to respond. From the time of his appointment as a warden, it became his responsibility to communicate light and impart knowledge to those who come under his direction. Welcome to From the Quarries. Tonight's video, Zerababal, is the first of a series of three looking at the stories of the principles in the Royal Arch chapter. It's once again taken from the excellent History of Royal Arch Masonry by Everett R. Turnbull and Ray V. Denslow. I hope you enjoy it. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries. An Archive of Masonic Law. Zerababal, as we know, was the son of Sheltiel, and the grandson of King Jehoiakim, king of Judah, who in the year 597 BC, after a reign of less than four months, was carried into Babylonian captivity with 10,000 of his subjects by Nebuchadnezzar, one of the greatest monarchs of the ancient world. The Hebrew signification of the name Zerubbabel is given as begotten in Babylon. Companion Laxton Sweet a past principal of the author's chapter, said of Zerubbabel, Born, no doubt, in the stirring and exciting times when the exploits and conquests of Cyrus and the Persians astounded the then-known world, he was, as a youth, caught up in the enthusiasm of that small band of his people who believed that Cyrus was the Messiah, destined, at Jehovah's instigation, to deliver them and their race from the Babylonian yoke. Cyrus, who had been referred to as God's shepherd by Isaiah, had become imbued with the knowledge of true religion as a result of the prophecies of Isaiah and his conversations with the prophet Daniel and other Jewish captives of learning and piety. Accordingly, says Josephus, an earnest desire and ambition seized upon him to fulfil the prophecy concerning him. So he called for the most eminent Jews that were in Babylon and told them that he gave them leave to go back to their own country and to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and the temple of God. He then, in the year 538 BC, issued the royal edict that constituted the starting point of the tradition of the Holy Royal Arch. This can be found in Ezra, chapter 1, verse 1. And so, in the following year, we find a brave band of Jewish pioneers undertaking the arduous adventure of returning to Jerusalem under the leadership of Sheshbazar or Shenen Bazar. It may be that Sheshbazar was either the Babylonian or Persian name of Zerubbabel. In the epistle sent by Cyrus to the Syrian governors, in which he informed them of the permission he had given to the Jews, he said, I have sent my treasure and Zerubbabel, the governor of the Jews, that they may lay the foundations of the temple. In the second chapter of Ezra, verse 2, it is stated that Zerubbabel, with others, went up out of the captivity, and in the next chapter we read, when the seventh month was come, then stood up Jeshua and his brethren, and the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of the God of Israel. And later we also read, In the second year of their coming into Jerusalem, namely the year 535 BC, they set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Objection to the work was then taken by a number of adversaries, who persuaded the successor of Cyrus 
to countermand the royal edict, and the work ceased for about 15 years, until the second year in the reign of Darius, king of Persia. In the meantime, Zerubbabel, who was an old friend of Darius, had evidently returned to Babylon and had become a member of the king's bodyguard. It was then that the interesting story about Zerubbabel, given in Esdras, originated, a story which has been dramatised in one of the Allied degrees. In the third and fourth chapters of the first book of Esdras is given the vivid narrative of the unique contest of wits in which Zerubbabel triumphed, and, by thus gaining the king's favour, attained to a position of influence which enabled him to get permission to return to Jerusalem and resume the work of rebuilding the temple and the holy city. Briefly, King Darius had to retire to bed after a great feast, and three officers of his bodyguard agreed together upon a contest of wits. The account given in Esdras states that each of them was to speak a sentence, write it down, seal it, and place the written sentence under the king's pillow. When the king rose from his slumbers, the sentences were handed to him, and it was arranged that the king and his court should decide which of them had said the wisest thing, and the winner was to be rewarded with the most signal marks of royal favour. The first wrote, Wine is the stronger. The second wrote, The king is strongest. And the third, who was Zerubbabel, wrote, Women are the strongest, but above all things, truth beareth away the victory. Each contestant brilliantly argued their respective propositions before the king, sitting in the royal seat of judgment, and attended by the princes of Persia and Media and all the officers of state. Zerubbabel was the last to speak, and in arguing his case, he displayed almost incredible courage for he dared to make some personal allusions to the king's weakness where a woman was concerned. The king and princes showed signs of uneasiness, and without doubt their wrath would have descended in some terrible form upon the presumptuous young man if he had not instantly switched off to a splendid conclusion and peroration about truth. The great climax of his oration swept the whole assembly off their feet and all the people shouted, Great is the truth, and mighty above all things. The fortune of Zerubbabel was made, and among other privileges, he was able to call the king his cousin. It is interesting to note, in passing, that that notion survives to this day, seeing that a man on whom the king has conferred a title of nobility is addressed by his majesty in the patent office as his trusty and well-beloved cousin. But the greatest privilege was the granting of his request to be allowed to complete the work of rebuilding the temple and holy city. Some say this story is a fable, but even if it be so, it is as much a part of the history of the ancient people as other stories about King Alfred and the burnt cakes and King Canute and the waves of the tide. And I now conclude by quoting the words used by Lord Amphil in completing his chat. It is interesting to Freemasons that such championship of truth, one of the three grand principles on which our order is founded, should be attributed to one of our great originals. What food for thought there is as we look back across the vista of 24 centuries on this picture of a new starting point for ancient people on that eternal quest for truth, on which mankind has ever been engaged. For more Masonic podcasts, videos, music, texts and artwork, visit fromthequarries.com or subscribe to our YouTube, Twitter and Facebook accounts by searching From the Quarries. Welcome to From the Quarries. Tonight's video, Jeshua, is another extract from the excellent History of Royal Archmasonry by Everett R. Turnbull 
and Ray V. Denslow. I hope you enjoy it. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic lore. The character I have to talk about is Jeshua. Jeshua was the son of Josedek, born during the captivity at Babylon. He was the first high priest after the return, a fellow worker with Ezra and Nehemiah. It is written of him that he discharged his all-important duties with ability and faithfulness at a time of extreme difficulty and in the face of many perils. Jeshua undoubtedly had the reputation of being one of the greatest high priests of the Jewish hierarchy, but his reputation certainly did not rest on the spoken or written word. He was preached at and hectored or bullied by prophet and scribe, and intrigued against by his brethren, but not a single word of his, either in defence or attack, has come to us. In Masonry, and in many other institutions, actions are considered greater than words. Jeshua was essentially a man of action. Jeshua's family history was somewhat tragic, and there seems to be a vein of tragedy running through his life. His grandfather, the high priest when Jerusalem was captured and destroyed, was butchered by order of Nebuchadnezzar. His father was carried captive to Babylon, Jeshua was born in captivity. His upbringing was that of an exile, always tragic, especially to a Hebrew. But his life as an exile was not all tragedy. It was both interesting and stirring. Nebuchadnezzar was not only a great conqueror, a great destroyer, he was also a great builder and a patron of the arts. Jeshua probably saw the rebuilding of the magnificent royal palace and watched the construction of the famous hanging garden on its terraced platform, one of the seven wonders of the world. He saw Babylon's culture carried far and wide and witnessed the birth of science and astrology. Later, he watched the rise of Cyrus, the all-conquering king of Persia, the defeat of the Babylonian hosts and the entry in state into the city of Babylon but always there must have been in his heart the longing to return to the land of his fathers. One can easily imagine that he hailed with joy the famous proclamation of Cyrus. All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him an house in Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Jeshua would no doubt be inspired with fervency and zeal, and, as one of the leaders of the exiles, he joined the enormous caravan which set out for Judea, laden with gold and silver vessels of the temple and other valuable property restored to their rightful owners by order of the king. By Masonic tradition, we are told that, during the captivity, the Jews had continued the ceremonies of the fraternity and had several lodges, especially one at Nahada on the Euphrates. Therefore, no sooner had they arrived at their destination than they erected a temporary tabernacle and called a council in which Zerubbabel presided as king, Jeshua as high priest, and Haggai as scribe or principal officer of the state. And it was by them determined to begin to rebuilding the temple on the foundations of the structure of Solomon. Having arrived at Jerusalem, Jeshua naturally took a leading part, in conjunction with Zerubbabel, in the erection of the altar of burnt offerings and officiated as high priest. Thus began a brief period of triumph. Masons and carpenters were ordered to prepare the stones and timber for the building. About the beginning of the second year after the return, the foundation of the temple was laid by Zerubbabel, 
the Grand Master of the Jewish Masons, assisted by Jeshua the High Priest as Senior Grand Warden, with great rejoicing and praise to God. As Royal Archmasons, we are naturally interested in the stories surrounding the preparation for and the foundations of the Temple. Although not strictly related to the life of Jeshua, the story is too good to pass by, so here, briefly, is the legend of the Foundation Stone. According to legend, at that time, in the era of Jeshua, there was in the house of the sanctuary a stone of foundation, which is the very stone that our father Jacob anointed with oil, as is described in the 28th chapter of the book of Genesis. And Jacob, and Jacob went, went out, out from Beersheba, Beersheba and went, went towards, towards Haran. Haran. And, he and he lighted upon, upon a certain place, place and, and tarried there all night, because, because the sun was set. set. And he, and took, he took of the stones of that place, and, and put them for his pillows, pillows and, and lay down, down in that, that place, place to sleep. sleep. Following his famous dream, Jacob rose, rose up early in the morning, morning and, took and took the stone that he had put for his pillows, and set it up for a pillar, and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, if God, God be, will, be will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat, and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house, and all of that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. The legend is that Adam possessed this stone while in the Garden of Eden. He used it as an altar and carried it with him on his emergence into the world, and that Seth received it from him. Noah preserved it in the ark and left it on Mount Ararat, where Abraham found it. His grandson, Jacob, took it with him on his flight to his uncle Laban in Mesopotamia and used it as a pillow when he had his celebrated vision near Luz. The history of the stone here becomes very indistinct, but one legend asserts that Jeremiah, escaping with a Jewish princess, took it to Spain, thence it was brought to Ireland, and that one of the Dalraid kings conveyed it to Scotland, and finally it was transported by Edward I from Scone to Westminster Abbey, where until recently it was in that place as a coronation stone. However, returning to the subject of Jeshua. When the foundation stone was laid by Zerubbabel and Jeshua, it was a time of great rejoicing, and it is recorded that the weeping of those that recalled the, form, the glory of the former temple was drowned by the joyous shouts of the mass of the people. Jeshua's career thus reached its zenith, but soon the note of tragedy crept in yet again. Dissensions, plots, and many troubles supervened, and Jeshua was not permitted to see the completion of his great work. His closing days must have been sad. Family affairs were not all harmony. His sons had taken unto themselves strange wives and were rebuked by the prophet Ezra. Even in the vision of Zechariah, he appeared a tragic figure. He was pictured as clothed in filthy garments, accused before the Most High by Satan, but acquitted and given rule in Jehovah's house. Nevertheless, he was always an important figure, the high priest and ruler of the people. When the Jews brought offerings of gold and silver from Babylon, the prophet was ordered by the Most High to make crowns for Zerubbabel and Jeshua, and to place Zerubbabel as king on the throne and Jeshua by his side. The council of peace shall be between them both. Zerubbabel was enjoined to maintain good understanding with Jeshua. Finally, about three miles west of Baghdad, on the Euphrates Road, in a grove of trees, stands the shrine and tomb of Nabi Yusha, or Kohen Yusha. It is the sepulchre of Jeshua, the son of Josedek 
the High Priest. For more Masonic content, subscribe to this channel, visit our website, or follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Welcome to From the Quarries. Tonight's video, Haggai, comes from a text I have which is unattributed, undated, and in fact probably isn't of Masonic provenance at all. Nevertheless, it does give a very good account of the life of the prophet Haggai, his significance to the Jewish faith, his place in the Bible, and by extension, his importance to the craft. I hope you enjoy it. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic lore. Haggai was a prophet of the remnant of Israel and Judah that remained after the seventy years in captivity, and his task was to instruct, encourage, and also rebuke after their recent return to the land. In particular, Haggai, in conjunction with Zechariah, was given the task of stirring up the enthusiasm to rebuild the temple of the Lord, and is the theme that we see running through Haggai's words. The name Haggai means festive or festival, and may be an indication that he was born during one of, or near, one of the feasts, perhaps the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, or the Weeks and Tabernacles. Others believe that his name is related to the celebration of the prophetic hope concerning the Temple and the glory of God. The first is more probable, but it is interesting to note that his recorded ministry began on a new moon festival day, and the book also records the festivities that will be enjoyed when the Lord rules in the day of Christ. How old he was, we don't know, but you could infer from Haggai chapter 2 verse 3 that he was around to see the former glory of the temple before it was destroyed, in which case he would have been in his early 70s or upwards. The date of this book is, I believe, the most precisely dated book in the whole of the Bible. Each sermon of Haggai is given to the exact day, and makes you wonder if he kept a journal with him to record his acts. The beginning of Darius's reign is well established at 522 BC, and, as each of the four messages he gave took place in the second year of that reign, that would make Haggai's period of ministry 520 BC. So we can place where we are in history, I shall briefly give some historical background. The Jews have been captive in Babylon for 70 years. During this time we have accounts from the likes of Daniel, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. The Jews were first taken captive in 606 BC, with the final destruction of the temple in 586 BC. It wasn't until the defeat of the Babylonians by the Persians in 539 BC, when Cyrus took over and changed the policy on foreign captives, that the outlook brightened for the Jews. In 538 BC, he decreed that they could return to their homeland and rebuild the temple. After an initial stage, opposition to the building stopped the work for a period of 14 years, and during this time, the people pursued their own selfish interests. God used Haggai and Zechariah to get the people and the leaders to once again focus on the work of God. Through the work of the prophets and the leaders, the temple was completed in 516 BC, exactly 70 years after its destruction. The time the Jews had spent in the land from the reign of Saul to the Babylonian captivity was 490 years and as part of the law, they were told to rest the land every Sabbath year, which they failed to do. This meant that 70 Sabbath years had been missed, and God made up for this by taking them all at once, giving the land the rest it was due. 
The lesson that comes out of Haggai is that we must consider our priorities, but that misplaced priorities can be diagnosed and treated. Here, the priorities were to rebuild the temple, and the purpose of Haggai was to get the people to resume construction. Haggai's writings are split into four parts. The first sermon, contained in chapter 1, is a message of conviction in which Haggai rebukes the people for having their priorities all wrong, followed by the response of the people. Firstly, we have the diagnosis of the problem. We are in the second year of the reign of Darius, and they are under the Persian rule. The date is the 29th of August, 520 BC, and Haggai approaches the governor, Zerubbabel, and the high priest, Jeshua. Then the Lord of Hosts speaks to them through Haggai. The people were saying that it was not time to rebuild the temple, something which they have already delayed for 14 years. Notice the language used here in this verse. This people say, not my people, as God usually calls them. God is distancing himself from the people's lack of enthusiasm towards God and his ways. The people are living in celled houses, often translated as panelled, and connected with royal dwellings. The panelling would have had to have been imported, probably from Lebanon, and so would have been expensive. This is what they were spending their money on, expensive furnishings, luxuries of living, and yet the temple stands uncompleted. With conviction, Haggai says, Consider your ways, for they had misplaced their priorities. They were not putting God first, and considered only their own comfort, which gave rise to dissatisfaction. And so, on to Haggai's second message, the message of courage. After they had got their priorities sorted and resumed the work of God, Haggai continued to preach to them. Now that they had gone back to work, that wasn't the end of it, for Haggai wanted to make sure they had gone back to work with the right attitude and motives. Haggai starts by comparing the temple with the one built by Solomon. Why would he bother doing this? The temple built by Solomon was amazing, covered in gold and decorated with beautiful ornaments. They weren't out to build a temple which was better than Solomon's, but that would have been motivation in itself, that they would have been building through pride rather than glory to God. However, this was not an option because they had just spent years in exile and would not have had much wealth, which they had been spending on themselves anyway. Remember, God had been causing drought and probably disciplined them in other ways too. They were not going to have vast stocks of precious metals and fancy materials to work with. So he asks, How many of them remember the former temple? It's around 70 years since the former temple stood, so probably only a few remembered, and would have recognised it as nothing like the temple that stood before. Not very encouraging for the new temple builders. So Haggai says, Be strong, take courage. Comparison is wrong. We need to do our best with the talents and resources that we have been given and not compare our lot to that of others. It was not the beauty of the temple that was to be its glory, but the presence of God. Haggai's third message is one of cleanliness. He starts by asking a question directed at the priests. If the priest is carrying something holy and it comes into contact with something that is unholy, does that thing become holy? The answer is no. If someone unclean touches something else, Does that make that other thing unclean also? The answer is yes. Holiness does not come about by contact with something holy, but contact with ungodliness or uncleanness does defile. Haggai shows the Israelites that they were guilty of this very thing. The holy rituals they had been performing in the past were useless. There was no obedience and their ungodliness had contaminated everything they did. Haggai looks back at the past. When they were not obedient, God kept them from prospering and smote them with wind, mildew and hail. They were being disciplined for their uncleanness. The last section of this book looks to the future, 
when God will do two things. God will overthrow the nations and kingdoms of this world. Has this happened yet? No. So God must be referring to the last days. In summary, the book of Haggai has five main points to teach. 1. We saw that Haggai rebuked the Israelites for, her, for having misplaced priorities, and he pointed out the results which were the dissatisfaction with the things of this world and discipline from God. 2. Their response was to obey God's message and resume the work on the temple. Their obedience, repentance and confession cleared their conscience so that they could worship God. 3. Their courage and motivation was to come from the promise of God's presence and his peace. This is the peace of mind that comes from knowing that God is in control. 4. Haggai also dealt with the issue of living clean and godly lives, so they would not defile their work and sacrifices. He also urged them to depend on God for life. 5. And finally, Haggai gave them hope for the future by revealing that God was going to destroy their enemies and establish his kingdom with them, his chosen people. For more Masonic content, subscribe to this channel, visit our website, or follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Welcome to From the Quarries. Tonight's presentation is entitled some notes on the history and symbolism of the Royal Arch Degree. It was written by Harold V. B. Voorhis and published in the Royal Arch Mason in 1964. I hope you enjoy it. Good evening and welcome to tonight's presentation From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic lore. This paper is deliberately headed Some Notes because the subject is far too extensive to be handled in a single paper. This applies to the historical portion, as I am at a loss how to do much with the symbolism part of it when addressing those who have not taken the Royal Arch degree itself. The intent is rather to provide some thoughts for individual research, for such activity produces advancement in Masonic knowledge. No attempt is made to propagate a particular school of thought. It is more factual than dogmatic, and the parts are not necessarily correlated. In particular, it seems pertinent to point out to those who are at some pains to interpret symbolism in an esoteric sense, that the symbols in the various Masonic degrees were originally put there by mortal men. Esoteric knowledge is not a modern achievement, and even the motives behind such demonstrations have changed over the centuries. Ceremonial Freemasonry was born in England in the 18th century and dramatised in the United States of America in the next century. The rituals were fabricated by two classes of men, those possessing considerable, if not great, occult knowledge, and those possessing none. The one group strove to make the rituals occult, esoteric and ceremonial, while the other strove to simplify everything or provincialize it. We might illustrate the situation by comparing two religious groups, men from the Roman Church, the Church of England and the Greek Church on the one hand, and men from the converts to Protestantism unceremonialized, such as Methodists, Presbyterians, Baptists, etc., i.e. conformists and nonconformists. It must be kept in mind, too, that the knowledge of occult symbolism was derived from an already existing store of such knowledge, some of which was already grafted onto the already existing operative Masonic lodges by the early speculative Masons, who, in their turn, learned from Rosicrucians like Henry Adamson, Sir Robert Moray, Thomas Vaughan, 
and certainly Elias Ashmole, who was made a mason in Warrington in 1646. That Freemasonry took its symbolism from definite earlier groups is borne out by the fact that there is not a scrap of evidence to show that ceremonial Freemasonry as we now know it existed before 1717 to 1723, nor that the Royal Arch Degree existed in any form before 1738. J. E. S. Tuckett has fairly conclusively proved that no Masonic degrees were formed on the continent prior to 1850. We must therefore assume that the Royal Arch was made in the British Isles, even though we do not know who made it or in what original form. None of the various theories have evidence to substantiate them. The Ancients, a group of Irishmen who formed the famous rival Grand Lodge in England in 1751, considered the Royal Arch the very root, heart and marrow of Freemasonry. The Grand Secretary of the original Grand Lodge, termed the Moderns, said in 1759 that our society is neither arch, royal arch, nor ancient. It is impossible to give voice to the symbolism of the royal arch degree without exposing the degree itself. As a matter of fact, it would be difficult to understand the references without having taken the degree. Consequently, but a few general statements must suffice in this department. The Royal Arch degree is a Jewish degree and based on Kabbalistic philosophy. If we examine the Tree of Life, we find three triangles, the supernal, the ethical and the astral. Freemasonry can be fitted onto the tree with the craft degrees falling in the astral triangle, the Royal Arch in the ethical and certain additional grades in the upper portion of the tree. In discussing a royal arch ritual, one would have to decide which ritual design he was symbolically explaining, as there are a number of allegories and a number of differences which are sufficient to change the whole picture. There are early and late rituals in England, Ireland, Scotland, the Americas, and the Sydney ritual, this latter being so different that the normal Royal Archmason might not recognise it at all. Besides, there are degrees of a similar design in the Scottish Rite. Some refer to repairing the first temple, and others to rebuilding it. Then there is the matter of the presiding officer being either the king or the high priest. For those interested in the biblical references to the two temples, see 2 Kings chapters 22 to 25 for the repairing of the first temple, and Ezra chapters 3 to 6 for the rebuilding of the second temple. Then there are the emblems of Royal Arch Masonry, the Triple Tor and the Tetragrammaton. So much has been written about these that it is simply suggested that you read items in any one of a number of reputable encyclopedias. However, a warning must be given that every writer has his own particular view as to the symbolic meaning of what the Royal Arch degree is. Some points are common to most all, but not many. For a degree which can be found dispersed in all sorts of rites and systems of Freemasonry, greater than any other except the Haramic legend of the first three degrees, it is not to be wondered that there is so much written about its lessons and with such wide variance. Generally speaking, there are two schools of thought concerning the message of the degree, or its purpose. One group lines itself up believing that it is the completion of the Master Mason's degree. The other, that it is an explanation of the Master's degree. A check made among a great number of Royal Arch Masons showed that about half of the rank and file of the membership thought it a completion of the craft degrees. For my part, I consider the two ideas the same, with some interpolations. It is obvious to brethren who have not received the Royal Arch degree that something is left wanting in the Master Mason degree. But it is likewise obvious to those who have been exalted to this degree that they have not fully received what they were looking for, although much has been added to the allegory, both symbolically and materially. 
In building up a symbolic story of the Royal Arch degree, it must be warned also that there are definite sections in the rituals which seem to have no bearing on the general theme whatsoever. They appear in the rituals at different dates, seemingly out of nowhere. One, in particular, given here as an instance, has been definitively traced. It is an elaborate lecture on the Royal Arch Jewel. It first appeared in the English ritual after publication on page 374 of the Royal Masonic Cyclopedia of Mackenzie, word for word. It crops up later with minor changes in the Irish and Scottish rituals. Then there are the various transplantings of the passing of the veil ceremony into the excellent master degree in England and in other places, and back again into the Royal Arch rituals of the United States of America. Next, there is the symbolism of the candidate finding various items in the vault. The differences in what is found would confuse a magician. The largest collection is a cube, three squares, coins, medals, a jewel, and the volume of the sacred law, and then the ark and its usual contents, four or five in number. The words of a Royal Arch Mason might be mentioned for symbolic comment, were it possible, without giving away the heart of the degree. I can say that the ritual explanations of these are silly. As it wasn't possible to read Egyptian hieroglyphics when the explanation of our Master Mason's word was devised, so it is with the others for similar reasons. Thus, when they are all taken together, these explanations simply do not make sense, materially, practically, or historically. Castells believes that the elements of the Royal Arch degree, in the Enoch or Haremic versions, I suppose, probably came from the Rosicrucian side, and he makes out a very good case too. He also suggests that the burning bush might be a symbol of the Tree of Life. The vault, in one form or another, appears to be the centre of Royal Arch symbolism. This links it to the Rosicrucian farmer, which tells the story of the finding of the vault of Christian Rosenkreutz. The discovery in Royal Arch masonry, by way of the ring in the slab of stone, is an exact correspondence with the farmer story. Historical research has shown that the differences in Royal Arch rituals exist as the result of what might be termed political action, or as the outcome of rival beliefs and jealousies. It is left to the individual to make up his mind as to which is likely to be the most valid, if such a term can be applied to any ritual which was compiled in the first place by a man or a body of men who may have had other ideas as to what was the right thing. How then are we to place before the brethren or companions a set of standard symbolic views of such a degree? Further, it is utterly incongruous to take any one of the three main royal arch rituals and build up a single symbolic system for propagation, except for the use of those who have seen it conferred, or clandestinely, shall I say, have read such a ritual. Even then, it would be a man's, or a group of men's, opinions. Therefore, our suggestion is to receive the Royal Arch degree. Then, read two or three treatments, and with these ideas as a background, add your own ideas, keeping within decent bounds, and build up a theory of the symbolism of the allegory based on the symbols used in the degree as conveyed to your mind. As imperfect as the degree is made out to be by certain liturgists, it is the only degree which offers the base material for a full and more perfect study of the art, Freemasonry. For more Masonic podcasts, videos, music, texts and artwork, visit fromthequarries.com or subscribe to our YouTube, Twitter and Facebook accounts by searching From the Quarries.
The emblem of the Royal Arch degree is called the Triple Tor, and is a figure consisting of three Tor crosses. The Tor cross, or cross of St. Anthony, is a cross in the form of a Greek T. The Triple Tor is a figure formed by three of these crosses meeting in a point, and therefore resembling a letter T resting on the traverse bar of an H. This emblem, placed in the centre of a triangle and circle, both emblems of deity, constitutes the jewel of the royal arch as practised in England, where it is so highly esteemed as to be called the emblem of all emblems, and the grand emblem of royal arch masonry. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic lore. The original signification of this emblem has been variously explained. Some suppose it to include the initials of the Temple of Jerusalem, TH, Templum Hira Solome. Others, that it is a symbol of the mystical union of the Father and Son, H signifying Jehovah, and T, or the Cross, the Son. A writer in Moore's magazine ingeniously supposes it to be a representation of three T-squares, and that it alludes to the three jewels of the three ancient Grand Masters. It has also been said that it is the monogram of Hiram of Tyre, and others assert that it is only a modification of the Hebrew letter Shin, which was one of the Jewish abbreviations of the sacred name. The equilateral triangle is a symbol of divine union, and was much revered by ancient nations as containing the greatest and most abstruse mysteries, and as a symbol of God, denoting a triad of intelligence, a triad of deity, a triune God. Moreover, the Tetragrammaton, or incommunicable name, was written by the Jews in a triangular form, the initial letter denoting the thought, the idea of God, a ray of light too transcendent to be contemplated by mortal eye. This name of God, the Tetragrammaton, could not be more aptly placed than in the symbol or triangle itself, and hence the true meaning of the royal arch double triangle, but originally represented thus, so that while this sacred emblem was deservedly revered by the Jews, both it and the double triangle itself are adopted as royal arch symbols. The circle is an emblem of eternity, having neither end nor beginning, and reminds us of the purity wisdom and glory of the Omnipotent, which is without beginning or end. A society of Royal Arch Masons is called a chapter, and not a lodge, as in the previous degrees. All chapters of Royal Arch Masons are dedicated to Zerubbabel, and the symbolic colour of this degree is scarlet. The Tor Cross is the emblem of Mercury, the God's messenger, who also conducts souls through the underworld, he takes the dead by one hand, and uplifting the caduceus in the other, leads them from the grave through the underworld to the Elysian fields, and before his caduceus the power of evil fled. The Tor cross is also a phallic symbol, and represents male and creative power. The lowest form of this is our animal passions, which must be controlled if we do advance spiritually. To do this, we trample a tour cross underfoot in the first three craft degrees as we advance to receive the secrets. Thus, by the time they reach the arch, Master Masons have made three tour crosses. Having subdued our animal passions while below the Master's chair, on being installed as a worshipful Master, these powers are transformed and now distinguish installed Masters from those over whom they rule. It is thus the higher side of the tour cross which is depicted in an installed master's apron. They now represent the divine power in man to create others in his likeness. It is the emblem of Brahma, 
and the creative aspect of the deity. In this sense, the Tor Cross symbolizes the divine spark, the spirit and creative power in man. The three Tor Crosses of the Royal Arch are joined together, whereas on an installed Master's apron they are separate. Master Masons are taught that death does not end all and are given hope of life beyond the grave. The installed Master degree, when fully worked, changes that hope to certainty. The three separate Tor Crosses on an installed Master's apron represent the three aspects of the Deity and show the newly risen man is not ready to appear before God. The three joined crosses of the Royal Arch teach that the three aspects of the Deity aren't separate gods, but different aspects of the One God. In man, they represent body, soul, and spirit, and their union shows a spiritual body, as St. Paul called it, will be united with a perfected soul and spirit when they finally attain onement with God. This is why, in the 19th century, only installed masters could be made Royal Arch Masons. Until a man had risen from the dead, he can't hope to understand God. Even after death, he must progress through the spirit planes before he is fit to stand before God. This lesson has been lost in England by abolishing passing the veils. Thus, the lost secrets can't be found in a craft lodge, and in reality, can only be found by an installed master who has been exalted into the royal arch and past the veils. Then he may exchange the three separate tour crosses on his craft apron for the triple tour of the royal arch. The royal arch is not essentially a Christian degree, but there were three crosses on Calgary, which reminds us of the use of the triple tour as Jesus would have been crucified on a tour cross. Thus, the tour cross links the five craft degrees and teaches the evolution and purification of body, soul, and spirit, which are now in perfect union, as shown by the Triple Tor. The Triple Tor, under the double triangles of the Royal Arch Jewel, teaches that man will ultimately rest in the presence of God. For more Masonic podcasts, videos, music, texts, and artwork, visit fromthequarries.com or subscribe to our YouTube, Twitter and Facebook accounts by searching From the Quarries. Good evening and welcome to tonight's presentation from the Quarries, an archive of Masonic Law. The Ineffable Name This lecture was delivered to Research Royal Arch Chapter Number 100 of the Supreme Grand Royal Arch Chapter of Queensland on Wednesday the 5th of February 1947 by Right Excellent Companion, the Reverend V. H. Whitehouse, Grand J. In the first of the ancient charges concerning God and religion, it is stated, A mason is obliged by his tenure to obey the moral law, and, if he rightly understand the art, he will never be a stupid atheist, nor an irreligious libertine. He, of all men, should best understand that God seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh at the outward appearance, but God looketh to the heart. A mason is, therefore, particularly bound never to act against the dictates of his conscience. Let a man's religion or mode of worship be what it may, he is not excluded from the order, provided he believe in the glorious architect of heaven and earth, and practice the sacred duties of morality, etc. Belief in God, then, is essential before a candidate is admitted to Freemasonry, and throughout all our ceremonies this belief is taken for granted. 
the question naturally arises, who or what is the God which Freemasonry proclaims? Several things are evident. A. The God of Freemasonry is the God of the Old Testament, and he has greater affinity with the ideas of the ancient world than with ours. B. Like the Old Testament, and the ancient world in general, Freemasonry does not attempt to prove the existence of God, nor to speculate how the knowledge of how that God is arose. Like the Old Testament, Freemasonry moves among ideas that presuppose God's existence. C. Again, like the Old Testament, Freemasonry teaches that the knowledge of God is progressive, i.e., God is known so far as he gives himself to be known. This part C is important, and removes what is a difficulty to some. There are ideas of God in the Old Testament that are crude, anthropomorphic, vindictive, and far removed from the Christian conception of the deity. But if it be remembered that God's revelation of himself is a progressive one, God revealing himself as men prove themselves capable of receiving new truths, the difficulty disappears. When reading the Old Testament, and I think also when studying the progressive steps in Freemasonry, it is important to note that the ideas of God therein proclaimed are relative to the state of civilization on the one hand, and the progress of the candidate on the other at that particular time. Nowhere is this more evident than in the names by which God came to be known. In the Old Testament, a name was never a sign distinguishing one person from another. It was always descriptive, expressing the meaning of the person to whom the name was given. Thus, when God is called by a name, it expresses that which God has made known of himself to man. It does not represent God himself as he is, but such a manifestation of him as human faculties were able to apprehend. It will be found that these names show that the ancient Hebrew started from some indeterminate conception of God common to the whole Semitic race, i.e. the people closely interrelated in language, custom, and physical features who occupied the southwest of Asia and were led on by degrees to a living apprehension of the being whom they worshipped. In this revelation of God, as expressed by the divine names, there are three stages. 1. Names used before Abraham. 2. Names used in the patriarchal ages, i.e. from Abraham onwards. And 3. Names used in the Mosaic age and afterwards. Names used before Abraham. These early names do not belong to Revelation, at least not to the family of Israel. They are prehistoric. They do not suggest the first stage of Semitic religion. They belong to the stage when the phenomena of the heavens were considered to be due to some power above them. 1. El, God. This title of the deity was widely used and belongs to the whole Semitic world. No satisfactory derivation of the word has yet been suggested. It appears to be part of the verb to be strong, and it suggests the idea of governor or leader with the sense of power or might. 2. Elohim An interesting title, and again common to Israel with most of the Semitic peoples. It is plural in form, and so has been thought by some to be a remnant of polytheism. But scholars are unanimous in saying that when used of God, Elohim is not plural in the sense of numbers. It is always used with a singular verb, and therefore is the plural of majesty or eminence, the plural of fullness or greatness. The singular of Elohim probably meant strength. The plural intensifies the idea. 3. El Elion, meaning God Most High, a name which distinguished the deity from other conceivable gods. Speaking generally, this group of terms may be described as universalistic in their meaning. They indicate the relation of God to all that he has made as its creator and sustainer. Names used in the patriarchal age. 
So far, these names express the general idea of God. He is the power to whom the world belongs. Now a development takes place. God is coming into relationship with his people, and development towards a high morality and faith in a spiritual, omnipotent God takes place. This development we know as the call of Abraham and the foundation of the patriarchal religion. And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me, and be thou perfect. Genesis 17 verse 1 Separated from his kindred and father's house, Abraham goes alone into the unknown world with only the God of heaven and earth, El, for his guide. And on the hilltop of Canaan, in the solitude of the desert, he meets God. I am God Almighty, El Shaddai. Walk before me, be thou perfect. The idea of God was becoming clear to Abraham. His faith took hold of the idea that God, the Omnipotent, was able to protect him as he ventured into the unknown. He who is called God, El, was El Shaddai, the supreme power who had given him his fellowship and was condescending to guide his life. Thus, El Shaddai marks an advance on Elohim. Its derivation and meaning is uncertain, but the idea conveyed is that of absolute control over the forces of nature and the course of history. Names used in the Mosaic Age This revelation, El Shaddai, was made to Abraham alone, not to his people, nor his family, nor his father's house. It was El coming into relationship with the individual soul. Now a further development takes place. God, El Shaddai, comes into relationship not only with individual, but with his people, for families and tribes become a nation and state, a communion and fellowship, not merely by blood, but by a common government and common institutions, and lastly, a strict and definite law. To mark this wider relationship from henceforth, God's peculiar name as God in Israel is Jehovah. In his revelation to Moses, God appropriated the name Yahweh to himself and stamped it as the name expressive of his relationship to Israel, now about to be entered into and manifested in deeds of redemption, and in memory of these deeds to be henceforth his peculiar name as God in Israel. Although the name Jehovah thus received new currency and significance in the time of Moses, it is far older than the time of Moses. E.g., in Genesis 4.26 it is written that in the time of Enos, the grandson of Adam, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord, Jehovah. This may seem difficult to reconcile with the statement in Exodus 4, And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord, Jehovah. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty, El Shaddai. But by my name Jehovah, Yahweh, was I not known to them. The meaning, however, is probably this. Although the name Yahweh was not unknown, its real significance had never yet been experienced by them. Now, God's character, as expressed by this name, would be fully manifested and that from henceforth it would become his name as God of Israel, and would be peculiar to the people of Israel. Its pronunciation The pronunciation Jehovah was not used in Holy Scripture until about 1520 AD, and does not claim to be correct. It came about in the following way. When it became unlawful to pronounce this name, probably from motives of superstition, various other words were substituted for it. Thus, the Septuagint translators, i.e. those who in 284 to 247 BC translated the Old Testament into Greek, substituted kurios, Lord, and the Masorites, ancient Jewish translators, the word Adonai, Lord. The vowel signs now used in Hebrew were not invented and written in manuscripts until 600 to 900 AD when one word was substituted for another in reading, 
it became the practice to attach the vowels of the word to be substituted to the consonants of the original word. Thus, the vowels of Adonai, A O A, were attached to the consonants Y H V H, this name of God. In 1518 AD, Petrus Galantius, confessor of Leo X, proposed to read the vowels and consonants as one word, and thus arose Yehovah, Jehovah, Y requiring to be spelled with an E instead of an A. Modern scholarship gives Yahweh, variously spelled J-A-H-V-E, J-A-H-V-E-H, Y-A-H-W-E-H, etc., as the correct pronunciation. Its meaning. The true meaning and derivation of the name is wholly unknown. In the Pentateuch, i.e. the first five books of the Old Testament, the word is brought into connection with the verb to be. This expresses not so much the idea of self-existence as what is or will be historically. I think this is suggested in the revelation of the name given in Exodus 3, verses 2 to 14. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, This thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Moses asked for God's name, i.e. a description of his nature and character, and he was taught that it was impossible to learn this all at once. God would be what he would from time to time prove to be. Each age would discover fresh attributes of his being. I will be what I will be. Yet, these revelations of God were not considered to be in the minds of those who received them shadows of of a reality to come. The unchanging. Hence it is said, I am Jehovah, I change not. Malachi 3, verse 6. To Moses, then, the name was a summing up of the divine character and attributes. These could not fully be understood by any one generation of Israelites. So Jehovah would continually manifest himself, all that he would be to his people. Thus it proved to be. Yahweh showed himself a deliverer of Egypt, a protector in the desert, all the acts of mercy on their journey from Canaan and their living there, all his guidance of their national development, all his discipline and punishments, were so many fresh revelations of the meaning of his name. It shows him to be present, future, eternal, unchangeable, and an all-sufficient God, who comes into close relationship with his people. There, the revelation of God in the early books of the Old Testament and in the first four degrees of Freemasonry ends. It remains for the succeeding degrees in Freemasonry to complete the revelation. Valuable lessons may be drawn from these revelations of God. First, reverence towards God a duty thus expressed in the charge after initiation, by never mentioning his name, but with that awe and reverence which are due from a creature to his creator, by imploring his aid in all lawful undertakings, and by looking up to him in every emergency for comfort and support. A duty further and most strikingly emphasized in the royal arch by the attitude of companions in their approach to the altar enshrined with his name. Secondly, a second lesson, perhaps more striking, is God comes into personal relationship with individuals and with nations. The Old Testament tells that the covenant name, Jehovah, was afterwards withdrawn, as if reluctance had gradually arisen to name the living God, or perhaps a vague dread of dishonouring his awful majesty. The revival of the primitive titles Elohim and El Elyon, 
God Most High, may seem to be a retrogression, but God moves in a mysterious way. Jehovah was a name peculiar to the people of Israel. It was God in covenant relationship with them, and so suggested him as belonging exclusively to Israel. Hence we find the cry, There is no salvation but of the Jews. Therefore, in the removal of the use of this name, through superstition or dread, we, I think, may see an act of providence, showing that the redemptive name of God was far beyond the pale of his covenant with Israel. God is not the exclusive deity of any one nation, a fact I think Freemasonry proclaims. Yet he is Yahweh, but not exclusive. He comes into relationship with individuals and with those nations and peoples who seek him. In conclusion, it is quite evident that the statement in the first ancient charge is very true, that if a Mason rightly understands the art, he will never be a stupid atheist nor an irreligious libertine. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic lore. Much has been written concerning various aspects of Royal Arch Masonry and its furnishings. Personally, I am interested in the four principal banners, and the object of this short address is to stimulate thought and interest into their origin. Their origin is connected with the remote past handed down in Hebrew folklore. We, in this present age, who would not consider anything of historical value unless it was in writing, are often credulous in regard to folklore and oral tradition. The four principal banners which we place on either side of the dais were the standards of the host of Israel. At every encampment, the tabernacle was erected in the centre of the square. In the Book of Numbers, we have recorded the order in which the Israelites were to march and keep their position when halted. The art of laying out an encampment appears to have been well understood in Egypt long before the departure of the Israelites from that country. And it was there, doubtless, that Moses became acquainted with that mode of encampment which he introduced among the Israelites. The plan was as follows. On the east side, the tribe of Judah would lead. Their banner was the lion. They were to be supported by the tribe of Issachar and the tribe of Zebulun. On the south side shall be the camp of Reuben with their banner of a man. They were to be supported by the tribe of Simeon and the tribe of Gad. On the west side shall be the standard of the camp of Ephraim, an ox, and by him shall be the tribe of Manasseh, and then the tribe of Benjamin. The standard of the camp of Dan, an eagle, shall be on the north side. The tribe of Asher and the tribe of Naphtali would support Dan. Each division had its separate standard, and each family had a separate standard about which it was to pitch its tents. The tabernacle occupied the centre of the camp, following the common practice in the east of the prince or leader of the tribe in the centre of the others. It should be borne in mind that Jehovah, whose tent was the tabernacle, was the leader of Israel. The tents nearest to the tabernacle were those of the Levites, whose business it was to watch it. In the 49th chapter of Genesis, we have recorded Jacob's dying message and blessing to his sons. Our ensigns give us a reputation of the prophetic utterance and blessing to each son. Judah, a lion, Issachar, an ass burdened, 
Zebulun, a ship. Reuben, a man erect. Simeon, a tower or a sword. Gad, a troop of horsemen. Ephraim, an ox. Manasseh, a fruitful vine. Benjamin, a wolf. Dan, an eagle with a serpent in his talons. Asher, a cup or flourishing tree. Naphtali, a hind let loose. As to the suggestion of why our banners are not placed in their original positions, the lion in the east, the man in the south, the ox in the west, and the eagle in the north, I can only reply that the ritual stations them as on the dais. It might also be remembered that the New Testament Gospels are theologically classified as Matthew the ox, Mark the lion, Luke the man, and John the eagle. The question which now confronts us is, what is the significance and origin of these four chief banners? Let us now see the position of these divisional banners, south a man, east a lion, west an ox, north an eagle. When we turn to the first chapter of Ezekiel, we have a description of the cherubim. Verse 10 reads, As for the likeness of their faces, They four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four also had the face of an eagle. Is this coincidence, or has tradition been remembered? So, what do we know about the cherubim? 1. Late Jewish Angelology In the composite system of Jewish angelology, the cherubim form one of the ten highest classes of angels, while another class is distinguished by the synonymous term of living creatures. These two classes together, with the ophanim, or wheels, are especially attached to the throne of the divine glory, and it is the function of the cherubim to be the bearers of the throne on its progress through the worlds. The Jewish liturgy, like the Te Deum, delights to associate the praises of Israel with those offered to God by the different classes of angels, and singles out for special mention in portion of the daily morning service, the Ophanim, the Haoth, and the Seraphim. We find an approach to this conception in the Apocalypse, where the four beasts or horses, though, like the twenty-four elders, they are always mentioned apart from the angels, and discharge some altogether peculiar functions, are yet associated with the angels in the utterance of of doxologies. The difference between the four beasts of Revelation and those of Ezekiel, both as to their appearance and to their functions, are obvious, but without the latter, how could the former have been imagined? A similar view is suggested in the similitudes in Enoch, in one passage of which the cherubim, seraphim, the ophanim, and all the angels of power are combined under the phrase, the host of God, and unite in the ascription of the blessedness of the Lord of Spirits, while in another, the four faces on the four sides of the Lord of Spirits, reminiscent of the Ezekiel, are identified or confounded with the archangels. Everywhere, however, a somewhat different view is presented of the cherubim. They are the sleepless guardians of the throne of his glory. They are the fiery cherubim, and together with the seraphim, exceptionally called serpents, are closely connected with paradise and placed under the archangel Gabriel. From these facts, we gather that in the last two centuries BC, there were different ways of conceiving the cherubim. 2. Scripture Mention Cherubim are mentioned a. at the expulsion of our first parents from Eden in Genesis 3 verse 24, when their office was to keep the way of the tree of life, i.e. to render it impossible for man to return to paradise and eat of the tree of life. In this account, there is no mention of their nature or form. b. We next read of them in connection with the furnishing of the tabernacle, in Exodus 25 verse 18, where directions were given to place the two golden cherubim on the top of the Ark of the Covenant. They were to be of beaten work, i.e. beaten with the hammer, and rounded, and not solid. They were fastened to the mercy seat, the lid of the ark, and, facing each other, stretched out their wings 
so as to form a screen over the mercy seat. They were called the cherubim of glory. Cherubim were also woven into, or embroidered upon, the inward curtain of the tabernacle, and the veil. C. The two cherubim placed by Solomon in the Holy of Holies, in 1 Kings 6, verse 23, were made of olive wood overlaid with gold. They had bodies ten cubits high, and stood upon their feet like men. The length of their wings was five cubits. They stood with their faces inwards, i.e. towards the holy place, the outward wing of each cherub touching the wall, and the tip of the other wing touching each other. D. Other references are as follows. He rode upon a cherub and did fly. 2 Samuel 22.11 and Psalm 18.10 The vision of four cherubim, or living creatures, seen by Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 1, verse 5 to 10, and that of the four beasts, or living creatures, in Revelation 4.61. 3. Form from the above descriptions and references, it is impossible to arrive at certainty respecting various particulars of the cherubim, and it is difficult to say whether this silence may have arisen from the fact that these figures were familiar to the Israelites, or whether it was intended to leave the matter in indefiniteness. A line of similarity runs throughout the whole Bible with regard to them, with slight modifications in their structure, due, perhaps, to the fact that the idea they were intended to express had become clearer as time ran on. Turning to the cherubim of Solomon, we find that they stood upon their feet. 2 Chronicles 3 verse 13 Thus leading us to believe that they had a human and not a bestial form. This is confirmed by reading the accounts in Ezekiel who says, This was their appearance, they had the likeness of a man, and there appeared in the cherubim the form of a man's hand under their wings. Of the four living creatures mentioned in the Apocalypse, it is said that the third had a face as a man, seeming to imply that the human figure was characteristic of them all, but that it, in addition to the figure, also had the face of a man. Whatever else, therefore, may have been associated with them, this much is clear, that the human element predominated in their form. But, they are marked by characteristics taken from other spheres of creaturely existence. Thus alike in the tabernacle, in the temple, and in the visions of Ezekiel and St. John, they had wings. In Ezekiel and the Apocalypse, they are said to have had not only the face of a man, but the face of a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Ezekiel speaks of them as in possession of all four faces. St. John apportions one only of the four to each while in the case of the cherubim, both of the temple and the tabernacle, no intimation is given that they possess more than one face, in all probability the human. Perhaps, however, the animal faces were latent in the cherubim of the tabernacle and capable of development. 4. Cherubim and the Throne An important question relative to the cherubim has reference to their position as regards the throne of God. Are they the bearers of that throne, or simply near it? Some Old Testament expressions appear to favour the former theory. Thus we read, Thou sittest upon the cherubim, shine forth, in Psalms 80 verse 1, and He sitteth enthroned upon the cherubim, and the earth is moved, in Psalm 99 verse 1. It may be questioned, however, whether the phrase, enthroned upon the cherubim, is not simply a condensed expression for seated on the throne which is guarded by the cherubim. Both in the Psalter and in the narrative books, it is the heavenly throne of Yahweh which is meant, the throne from which he rules the universe and guides the destiny of the nations. These and similar passages must be taken figuratively, for in the book of Moses it is the mercy seat that is God's throne. These figures appear to have been suggested by the position of the cherubim upon the Ark of the Covenant, and to suggest the idea of close proximity to the throne of Jehovah in service and in worship. 5. Meaning It is evident that they do not represent attributes of the Almighty, for this would be in direct contradiction to the commandment, 
Thou shalt not make any likeness of anything, etc., in Exodus 20, verse 4. Again, they are represented as worshipping, and have ascribed to them creaturely position and ministerial character. The three leading theories of this are the mythical, real, and symbolical. The mythical theory. According to the mythical theory, the cherubim was an imitation of the Egyptian sphinx or of those composite animal forms belonging to Central Asia and to be met with, above all, upon the Assyrian and Babylonian monuments. 2. The real theory. This theory takes the cherubim to be supermundane spiritual essences, spiritual beings of a higher order than the angels. In support of this theory, it is argued that God would not have placed symbols of the pure creation of the Hebrew fancy at the gate of paradise. The comparison made between the king of Tyre and a cherub in Ezekiel 28 verse 14 is thought to be intelligible only on the assumption that the prophet conceived of the cherub as a supermundane spiritual being. Again, in the vision of Revelation chapter 4, the four beasts or living creatures are not animal existences representing material creation or the animal kingdom, but spiritual beings that surround the throne of God. Symbolical theory. Those holding this theory believe that the cherubim are symbolical figures, ideal conceptions, which have no corresponding representatives among actual living things. The important question then is what do they represent? Dr. J. Strong says, We venture to expound them as cosmical emblems of the divine attributes, or as modern science, somewhat atheistically we fear, styles them, the laws of nature. They are the creative and providential functions of God, exercised in behalf of his human subjects. The four faces are the main index of their typical significance. The human devotes intelligence, the leonine strength, the bovine perseverance, and the aquiline rapidity, so that we have the complete picture of an omniscient, omnipotent, uniform, and ubiquitous maintenance and superintendence of the eternal fortunes and affairs of the body of true worshippers, i.e. the church of all time. Dr. Milligan says, Thus, therefore, we reach the meaning and purport of the cherubim. They are an emblem of man, associated on the one hand with the inanimate, and on the other with animated creation, all brought into the immediate presence of God, all placed close around his throne, and either filling or stretching forth to fill the most holy of holies with their presence. Fairburn concludes thus, They, the cherubim, were ideal representatives of humanity in the highest and holiest places, representative not of what it actually is, but what it was destined to become, when the purpose of God in its behalf is accomplished. God manifested as dwelling between the cherubim, is God appearing in a state of blessed nearness to men, etc. Perhaps, as has been suggested, they are sometimes spoken of as mythical, and at other times as real. In striving to show that the banners of the Holy Royal Arch had their origin in the oral tradition relating to the cherubim, those guardians of paradise and messengers of God, I trust that the significance of the banners may have a far deeper meaning than it first appears, and that others will be stirred into seeking for underlying truths in many of our Masonic emblems. For more Masonic podcasts, videos, music, texts and artwork, visit fromthequarries.com or subscribe to our YouTube, Twitter and Facebook accounts by searching From the Quarries. The Banners. This lecture was delivered to the Research Royal Arch Chapter Number 100 of the Supreme Grand Royal Arch Chapter of Queensland on Wednesday, the 6th of August, 1947, by Right Excellent Companion A. T. Pollard, PGH, First Principle. When the Israelites marched through the wilderness after their deliverance from the captivity in Egypt to the Promised Land, 
it was necessary that order and regulation be observed, that every tribe receive an equal share of care and attention, also performed a share of work and toil, that the greatest good may result to the benefit of all. The several tribes were easily distinguished by the ensign they bore. On these were the distinctive bearings of the tribe, figurative of the peculiar blessing bequeathed to the father of each by the patriarch Jacob, who, before his death, assembled them together for that purpose. During their journeyings, they were placed in a particular position, also when encamped around the tabernacle. They were divided into four divisions, with three tribes in each, in the following order. The eastern division comprised the tribes of Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The southern division, Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. The western division, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. The northern division, Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. The eastern division was led by the tribe of Judah. Its banner thus became the standard of the division. The standard of Judah was borne by Nashon, its prince. It was designated by a lion Cushon, surmounted by a crown and scepter on a crimson field, in accordance with the blessing. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey. My son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall be the gathering of the people be. Judah was the chief tribe, and was more eminently distinguished, both for prosperity in war and peace, and quietness in the home. Its dignity was marked by divine favour. The choosing of David from this tribe to be the instrument of his blessing to the people of Israel. Thus, to the tribe of Judah was assigned the most honourable station in the camp, viz. in the east, before the tabernacle, and under its standard, the tribes of Issachar and Zebulun pitched their tents. The lion is symbolical of strength and power, majesty and kingly rule. Issachar was the second tribe in the eastern division. Its banner was sky blue, and its device a crouching ass, the colour of sky blue meaning the heavenly colour, the lord of heaven, perfection, heavenly character, conduct, fidelity. The name Issachar means he brings or his wages. The banner of Issachar was borne by the standard bearer by the prince Nethaniel. As stated, its colour was sky blue and was charged with a strong ass, crouching beneath its burden. The ass is a patient animal and a proper symbol of labour. Jacob's blessing to this, his fifth son, was, Issachar is a strong ass, crouching down between the sheepfolds, and he saw a resting place that it was good, and the land that it was pleasant, and he bowed his shoulder to bear, and became a servant under the task work. Accordingly, we find the posterity of Issachar sat down quietly upon the land and cultivated it with diligence and assiduity. Thus we see that the ass, crouching between two burdens, is a symbolical representation of the indolent character of this tribe, a character plainly shown as a quiet, stolid, persevering, shrewd, brave, practical man, with great powers of patience and endurance, industrious withal, and submissive to authority. It is a picture of one who enjoys rest and comfort, but at the same time is willing to earn it by hard drudgery. A picture of a patient plodder, hardy, healthy and robust, content to stay at home because he finds there what satisfies his wants and meets his modest, modest aspirations. And, indeed, it is no wonder that Issachar's, as a tribe, were content to stay at home. For Issachar's resting place was indeed among clover. His portion was the fat of the land, the cream of Palestine. Jezreel, the sowing place of God. 
The banner of the tribe of Zebulun was erected by the prince Eliab. It was purple. The design, a ship. The blessing of his father reads, Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea, and he shall be for an haven of ships, and his border shall be upon Zidon. The tribe of Zebulun was the third tribe of the eastern division. Of this tribe it is said, Zebulun, in thy going out, bringing the abundance of the seas, we know what that bespeaks. We know what spirits proximity to the sea and possession of ships and harbours meet and develop in a people. Even the spirit of adventure, the spirit of enterprise, the spirit of brave acceptance of risks, the spirit of restless endeavour. Zebulun has accordingly become typical of such a spirit. Adventure, daring, enterprise and energy. The Zebulans of the human family are your bold adventurous spirits, whose welfare depends so much on finding a suitable sphere. Restless, go-ahead ones, who need scope for their energies to develop the best in them. There turns up a Zebulun in many a family. We later find four of the apostles called of this tribe, and so found scope for their energies in labour for their master. Thus, the eastern division of the army of Israel numbered of the tribe of Judah, 74,600, of the tribe of Issachar, 54,400, of the tribe of Zebulun, 57,400. The total for the eastern division was 186,400. The leading tribe of the southern division was the tribe of Reuben. The great banner of the division, which was borne by Prince Elizur, was another of the cherubic forms, viz. a man, because Reuben was the firstborn of his father. The name Reuben means, behold, a son. The colour of the banner was red, symbolical of earthly glory. The device, a man, signifies intelligence, human nature, compassion and sympathy. His blessing of his father reads, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed. Then defilest thou it, he went to my couch. Poor Reuben, he fairly got a knockout blow that day when, as the eldest of the family, he took his place at the head of his brethren by his father's bedside. As firstborn, he should have received the rights and privileges which includes a double portion of those assigned to his brethren, and also the leadership or headship of the clan. As for the leadership, nominally it had been Reuben's all the time, but actually it had long since dropped out of his hand and had been picked up by Judah, to whom, rather than to Reuben, father and sons, had got into the way of looking for counsel and guidance. Thus, it was that the weakness of Reuben lost him his birthright. There are many Reubens today who become unstable and are overcome by their passions and fall. Though full of high gifts, born with a silver spoon in their mouth, the ball of life at their feet, great things expected of them, that they are destined for big things, that they will go far, that they will reach high, but they have never arrived, all because of the Reuben luck. As Moses, at the blessing of the tribe in the book of Deuteronomy, said, Lest Reuben live and not die, and let the men be few. Which looks, looks like a polite way of saying, There must needs be Reubens among us, but the fewer the better. Let no one say I am a Reuben born unstable as water, no hope of excelling for me, there is a hope for Reuben, as for others. His interests are secured under the covenant, and the grace of the covenant can work wonders. Let no Reuben despair. Grace gives him, too, his chance of raising his dead self to higher and better things. The banner of Simeon is yellow, the design a tower or a sword. Simeon and Levi were joined. The name Simeon means hearing with acceptance. The name of Levi means joined or cleaving to. 
the symbol of the sword, slaughter, power for judgment, symbol of judgment. Prince Shalumiel, as leader of the tribe of Simeon, bore a yellow banner emblazoned with a tower or a sword. Simeon and Levi were represented by the implement of war, the former by a sword and the latter by a dagger, in allusion to the abhorrence of Jacob of the cruelty of these two sons. Simeon and Levi are of a very different calibre from Reuben, their full brother. He was weak, but amiable, and they were strong, but unamiable. They stand forth hand in hand, representatives of a cruel, fierce, vindictive disposition. They are put together in Jacob's blessing. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Weapons of violence are their swords. O my soul, come not thou into their counsel. Unto their assembly, my glory, be thou not united. For in their anger they slew men, and in their self-will they huffed oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it was cruel fierce, and in their wrath, for it was cruel. And I will divide them in Jacob, and scatter them in Israel. Having been associated in wickedness, it was ordained by a superintending providence that their posterity should be disunited, that they might not be furnished with an opportunity of working evil upon their brethren. Hence, the tribe of Simeon had little or no possessions in the promised land, but dwelt in the midst of Judah. As for the tribe of Levi, it was entirely dispersed among the other tribes and devoted exclusively to the service of the altar. Let us not forget that if there is, in this life, there are penalties for past sins from which there is no deliverance, so that life can never be as it might have been if that sin had not been committed. There is also the possibility of turning these very penalties into stepping stones to higher places. The past may be irrevocable, but God is always proffering fresh starts and new chances. The banner of Gad is white, the design a troop of horsemen. The colour white means purity, righteousness, justice. Gad means overcoming and good fortune. Jacob's blessing to Gad reads, A troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at last. The banner of the tribe of Gad was under the charge of Prince Eliasaph. It was white with the design of a troop of horsemen. It was in allusion to this name that Jacob foretold the many difficulties that would be opposed to the progress of his posterity by the hostility of their neighbours. And, though they suffered defeat on many occasions, yet, in the end, by divine assistance, they were able to establish themselves firmly on the portion allotted to them. It, being beyond the Jordan, was subject to the incursions of the Ammonites, who were at length, by the military ability of Jephthah, finally subdued, and troubled them no more. Thus the blessing was fulfilled. They were overcome many times, but the undaunted spirit of Gad would not allow him to acknowledge defeat. This example should encourage each one of us to cultivate the spirit of Gad. It is an invaluable asset in every department of life's work and warfare. Let us, therefore, remember that God has given us not the spirit of fear or cowardice, but the spirit of power and courage, and to find in defeat and failures not a cause for despair, but a summons to a higher devotion and a larger endeavour. The total number of the southern division of the army of Israelites is as follows. The tribe of Reuben, 46,500. The tribe of Simeon, 59,300. The tribe of Gad, 45,650. A total of 151,450. The banner of Ephraim is dark green and the design is that of an ox. The name Ephraim means twofold increase, very fruitful. The ox denotes patience, industry and strength. The banner of Ephraim was the leading standard of the Western Division. Ephraim stepped into the inheritance of his father Joseph and was elevated into one of the leading tribes of Israel. His dark green banner, borne by Prince Elishama, 
was concentra- consecrated with the figure of a cherubic emblem of the deity. For Jehovah said, Ephraim is the strength of mine head. Jacob's blessing to Joseph, the father of Ephraim, was, Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a fountain. His branches run over a wall. We find, if we look at the life of Joseph, that it supplies abundant material for the study and illustration of expansion and fruitfulness. He grew till he became a great tree, in his shadow his brethren and others found shelter. This was his reward for his adherence to, and his continued faith in, the God of Jacob, his father. After the many trials and patient endurance during the early years of his residence in Egypt, the path he trod brought him to that victorious achievement and their blessing that enabled him to assist his family in their time of need. The banner of Manasseh was flesh-coloured. The design was a vine on a wall. The name Manasseh means forgetting or forgetfulness. Prince Gamaliel led the tribe of Manasseh. Their tents were pitched under a flesh-coloured banner, which was charged with a luxuriant vine planted by the side of a wall, which its tendrils overhung. Manasseh, being the son of Joseph, he shared with Ephraim the blessing of his father, and the future of both these tribes was fulfilled by their preeminence. The banner of Benjamin is green, the design a wolf. Benjamin means son of my right hand, or son of days, or old age. The banner was borne by the Prince Abidan, and, as stated, was green, emblazoned with a wolf, because it was ever a warlike and cruel tribe. It was predicted that Benjamin is a wolf that raveneth, and in the morning he shall devour his prey, and at even he shall divide the spoil. Though Benjamin was a great favourite with Jacob, as, being his youngest son, he gave him no special blessing, but described him as the father of a fierce and warlike people, which was amply exhibited in the many attacks made on the other tribes and the overcoming of them in battle. Saul also sprang from this tribe, and was possessed of great military talents. Practically the whole of his life was spent in war, and he and his sons were slain in battle. It is thus quite evident that the prediction of Jacob, his father, was of divine inspiration. Benjamin was the smallest of the tribes, but the wolf in him made up for his deficiency in numbers, and made him at once a force to reckon with, and an ugly customer to deal with. The Benjaminites were adroit and courageous warriors, as, if in despite of their name, son of my right hand, they seemed to have acquired a deadly proficiency in the use of their left hand. They were famous in Israel for their slinging and archery, and, when their backs were to the wall, they defied all comers. King Saul, the Benjaminite, entered well into Jacob's blessing, but in the even tide of his life there was no spoil for him to divide. He was in the spoil of others. St. Paul, twice in the course of his epistle, mentions the fact that he belonged to the tribe of Benjamin and mentions, mentions it in such a way as to show that in his day he had been proud of belonging to that ilk. The wolf of Benjamin was in his blood and revealed itself in his energy, intensity, courage and covetousness of attainment. It was innate in him alike as Saul the persecutor and as Paul the apostle. As a persecutor of the church, he was particularly wolfish in his raids on the fold. Then he was apprehended by the divine grace of the master. Grace laid hold of him. Before, without knowing it, he let himself become the devil's wolf, greedy for the blood of the saints. He remained a wolf when grace got hold of him, but he was henceforth the Lord's wolf, greedy and a thirst for souls to bring to the Lord's feet. Thus, we are to learn to use our failings for the benefit of righteous things to the glory of the true and living God Most High. The number of each tribe in the Western Division was the tribe of Ephraim, 40,500, 
the tribe of Manasseh, 32,200, the tribe of Benjamin, 35,400, and the total, 108,100. The banner of Dan was bright green, the device an eagle. The name Dan signifies judging. The eagle signifies strength, heavenly vision, also symbol of omniscience. Jacob said, Dan shall judge his people. The tribe was the largest next to Judah, and it was, it was for this reason probably that it was placed in the rear. The great banner was borne by Prince Aziah. Jacob also said, he shall be a serpent in the way. The tribe of Dan was remarkable for defeating the enemies rather by policy than by force, of which there are many instances in the Bible. We must also remember that the tribe of Dan were the ringleaders of idolatry. Dan had distinctive talents of his own. Jacob saw in Dan qualities and characteristics which, rightly developed and applied, would make him a valuable asset to Israel by making him an ugly customer to the Philistines. He saw in him something of the subtlety of the serpent and the adroitness of the adder, fitting him for the role which was to be his, a border raider or guerrilla fighter, versed in cunning strategy, watchful of his opportunity to strike a quick, quick blow from ambush at a passing troop. Another of the talents of Dan was along industrial lines. It showed itself in deftness of hand and skill in workmanship, as is evidenced alike in the building of the tabernacle and the, and the temple. In the building of the tabernacle, we well know of Aholiab, of the tribe of Dan, a curious carver and embroiderer, in blue, in purple, in scarlet, and in fine linen. Whilst, in the case of the temple, the king of Tyre said to Solomon, I have sent a cunning workman, endued with understanding, the son of a woman of the daughters of Dan. Thus we learn that Dan's attributes and talents consecrated to the service of the master become a valuable asset. The banner of Asher was purple, the device a cup. The name Asher means upright, happy or fortunate. Purple means royalty, Christ as king and lord heavenly and earthly glory, kingly dignity. His blessing reads, His bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. Prince Pagiel unfurled the banner of Asher, the cup. Asher's tribe is promised a tract of land in the Holy Land, which should be fruitful and prolific, and accordingly it produced the necessities of life in abundance, and Mount Carmel abounded in the choicest fruits. Ashes is the sort of blessing which most of us can readily enough appreciate. It is the blessing desired by a great many of us, the privilege of material abundance with its attendant promise of ease and comfort, independence and influence. The blessing may be our portion may not be of material abundance, but perhaps knowledge, understanding, sympathy and goodwill. And to use the blessing aright, we are to give our possessions fully and freely to all. If we would enter fully into Asher's heritage, we must not only be eaters and enjoyers, but also purveyors and dispensers of our God-given blessings. The banner of Naphtali is royal blue, the design a hind let loose. The name Naphtali means my wrestling or twisting. The blessing, Naphtali is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. The banner of Naphtali was borne by Prince Ahira. The prophecy denotes that the posterity of Naphtali should be a spirited and free people. It also carries with it the idea of hard struggle, and likewise with it the assurance of struggle rewarded. Descriptive of conflict, it is at the same time indicative of achievement crowning conflict. One rem remembers that the portion of the promised land given to Naphtali was Upper Galilee, along with the fertile terraces which dip down from Mount Tabor. It is said there is something in the free air of mountains that goes a long way to make heroes and warriors. 
We recall that in her great fight for freedom, Deborah owed much to her Highland Brigade, the men of Naphtali and Barak. Her chief henchman was a man of Naphtali. Centuries later, the land of Naphtali provided the Maccabees with their best fighters in their struggle for independence. Again, the land of Naphtali was the scene of much of our Lord's ministering. In it, most of his mighty work was done. As one might put it, its flowers, its fruit, its crops, its manners and customs, its birds and beasts were all used to illumine the gospel message, to bring light first to the people and through them to others. The first messenger of the gospel and the kingdom went forth from the land of Naphtali, and the chief of them were the natives of the soil. The northern division of the army of Israel numbered the tribe of Dan, 62,700, the tribe of Asher, 41,500, the tribe of Naphtali, 53,400, and the total, 157,600. The total of the four divisions of the army of Israel In the Eastern Division, 186,400. In the Southern Division, 151,450. In the Western Division, 108,100. In the Northern Division, 157,600, giving a total of 603,550. Masonry was not formulated to give an historical account of the building of King Solomon's temple and its rebuilding by Zerubbabel. Masonry is a way of life. It sets out by means of symbols and allegory the way to live life in accordance with the wishes of the true and living God Most High. In this lecture, I propose to give more details on some of the important aspects referred to in the Royal Arch Ritual, commencing with Zerubbabel, and proceeding through the matters affecting the rebuilding of the temple. Zerubbabel was chosen by Cyrus to lead the captives back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Zerubbabel was called by two other names, Sheshbazar, this is his Babylonian or Chaldee name, and Tershatha, a Persian title meaning governor. His personal name, Zerubbabel, means descended of Babylon which indicates that he was actually a child of the exile, born in Babylonia, probably in the city of Babylon itself. This also indicates that in the case of Zerubbabel personally, the coming to Jerusalem with the 50,000 remnant was not a return, but his first coming. There is nothing to suggest that he had ever seen Jerusalem or Judea before. He is called Zerubbabel the son of Sheltiel. His lineage makes his leadership of the captives more noteworthy. He was directly in the royal line of David, being the great-grandson of King Jeconiah, who began to reign at the age of 18, but was carried off captive to Babylon three months later. Of Zerubbabel's personal character, we do not know a great deal. His religious zeal is implied in his leadership of the captives to Jerusalem. We note his care to conform to the restored worship of God, and his response to the two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. But the threefold glory which immortalizes him is that, one, he captured the remnant of captives back to Judea, two, he laid the foundation of the new temple, and three, he completed the erection of the new temple. The Exile at Babylon Babylon had crumpled and perished before the resistless spread of the Persian Empire, and the Jews seemed to have fared none too badly under the Persian rule. Thus, when the providential opportunity came for repatriation, the bulk of the nation, to their shame, 
preferred their tolerable and perhaps even lucrative life under Persian rule, to which they had now become quite accustomed. This explains why so small a number returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple under Zerubbabel and endure the hardships of finding the ruins of the structure and the country round in a state of real poverty. The Return to Jerusalem It must have been a sore problem to thoughtful Jews that the throne of David was no more. The people were, were returning not to rebuild a throne, but a temple. Indeed, the rebuilding of the temple was a thing for which preeminently the Persian Emperor Cyrus had issued the edict precipitating the return of the Jewish remnant to Jerusalem and Judea. Perhaps there is a lesson as timely as it is vital for our own days. Note it well. Even before Nehemiah is sent to rebuild the city, Zerubbabel is sent with the remnant to rebuild the temple. In any national reconstruction, we must begin there with the temple, that is, with God. Our leaders and reconstructors of the present period will not learn. They persist in the idea that the city must be built before the temple. All rebuilding starts with the spiritual side. What did the Jews have remaining? There were three things which remained more than all others. 1. The teaching of the past. A past such as no other people ever had, with a significance attaching to it as did not attach to the history of any other nation. The teaching of that past had reached a point of completeness in the exile for which the remnant had just returned. That is, certain processes in the nation's past had worked themselves out completely to their ultimate issue and to their bitter end. In retrospect, the covenanted people could now see in grimly complete lines just where the processes of apostasy had brought them, and it was vital that they should now learn unforgettingly the teachings of their nation's past. 2. There was the prophetic promise for the future. Although the Davidic throne was no more among them, the Davidic line was. And three, there was the presence of Jehovah with them in the present. That presence had been strikingly guaranteed to them in the decree of Cyrus, the Persian emperor calling on the Jews to return to their native land and to rebuild the temple of Jehovah in Jerusalem. What must have been, what must have been the feelings of the Jews during the last years of the cap captivity in Babylon, when the fame of Cyrus began to spread, when Babylon fell, and when the new emperor, Cyrus, who had been actually forenamed by Isaiah 200 years earlier, gave his edict for the rebuilding of the temple at Jerusalem exactly as Isaiah had foretold. Thus, in addition to the proclamation of his conversion to Jehovah and Jeremiah's prophecies as to the exact duration of the servitude to Babylon, must have shown the Jews beyond all doubt that Jehovah was with them in their return to Judea. One of the outstanding features of this period is that the temple was the supreme surviving link between the nation's great past and its still greater prophesied future. The temple was now, above all things, 1. The symbol of the unity of the nation, the more so now that the earthly throne had disappeared. 2. The reminder of the nation's high calling and function. 3. The sign that Jehovah was still with them, his chosen people. And 4 the focus of the true emphasis of the national life. It was in the light of that temple that all the past was to be read, and the present reconstructed, and the future anticipated. Judah alone was to preserve the divine worship of the true and living God Most High. Israel, unlike other nations, had no destiny apart from God's service, hence their interest in the temple. It was part of the national life. This has proved over long, long periods of time that Israel has not existed and cannot exist for itself. It is the divinely appointed priest of the nations. The Exile of Seventy Years The Jewish exile in Babylonia is often spoken of as the Seventy Years Exile and is quoted as such in our ritual on the basis of Jeremiah's prophecy. But it would occur to any thoughtful companion that if the exile lasted 70 years, practically none of those that went into it as adults could have been alive, let alone physically able to join Zerubbabel in the journey to Jerusalem 
at the end of the period. But the volume of the sacred law says many that had seen the first temple of King Solomon, when the foundations of the new temple were laid before the eyes, wept with a loud voice. Are we to think that these men were all ninety years or over? No, for the exile lasted fifty-two years, not seventy. Daniel was taken with the first lot, which was eighteen years prior to the main event, when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple and the holy city, so that the small lot with Daniel were seventy years in captivity, but the main lot with Nebuchadnezzar were fifty-two years in captivity. It began in 587 BC, and ended with the decree of Cyrus in 536 BC. This would mean a seventy years rule for Babylon, commencing with the first raid on Jerusalem, Daniel and a small lot were taken off to Babylon. The Decree of Cyrus Let us not miss the point that the proclamation of Cyrus, which occasioned the return of the captives to Jerusalem, was directly attributed to divine constraint. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he make a proclamation. The wording of Cyrus' press proclamation is certainly remarkable. Jehovah, the God of earth, have given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judea. How came this Persian emperor to have such knowledge of, and reverence for, and guidance from God of El? In some way or other, Cyrus had come under the influence of the Jewish religious teaching. After Cyrus' conquest of Babylon, the new emperor was shown the remarkable prophecy of Isaiah, written 200 years earlier, in which Cyrus is actually named in advance as the destined restorer of the Jews and the rebuilder of the temple. Cyrus, having seen the Isaiah prediction, was at once seized with an earnest desire and ambition to fulfil what was so written. It is understandable that the Isaiah prophecy would stir up a keen appetite in the mind of Cyrus to know more of Israel's inspired scriptures. The Samaritans The Royal Arch Ritual says in part, Our neighbours the Samaritans have already made similar proposals, but Zerubbabel rejected the offer of the Samaritans to help in the rebuilding of the temple, and they were a source of annoyance to the workers, and, for a time, were successful in having the work brought to a standstill. Who were the Samaritans, and why did Zerubbabel refuse their help? Under the decree of Cyrus, only those descended from the captives taken to Babylon were permitted to rebuild the house of the Lord. The Samaritans were not descended from those t taken captive to Babylon, although at the time, time of Zerubbabel's return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, they were also in the domain controlled by Cyrus. On the death of King Solomon, Rehoboam became king, but, due to a revolt by ten of the tribes under Jeroboam, there was a division of the one united kingdom over which Saul, David, and Solomon had reigned, into two kingdoms, the two kingdoms henceforth being known respectively as Israel and Judah. The kingdom of Israel, comprising ten of the tribes, becomes the northern kingdom, with Samaria as the capital, while the kingdom of Judah, comprising the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, becomes the southern kingdom, with Jerusalem remaining as the capital. The Edict of Cyrus is to all Israel. It must be remem remembered that Assyria, which took the ten-tribed kingdom into captivity, had become absorbed into the Babylonian Empire, which in turn now became part of Cyrus' dominion. Undoubtedly, the chiefs of Judah and Benjamin responded, seeing that it was to Jerusalem and Judah that the remnant was to return. But with these were all those who the Spirit of God has stirred. Thus it can be seen that although the Samaritans were in the dominion of Cyrus, they were not descendants of those taken captive at the destruction of King Solomon's temple, and were therefore not eligible nor allowed to assist in the rebuilding of the temple by Zerubbabel. Ezra Although the temple was completed in four and a half years after the arrival of Haggai and Zechariah, and much of the credit for the expedition of the work is due to the energy and zeal of Haggai, yet 
the important work of Ezra and his contingent of scribes cannot be overlooked. The arrival of Ezra was 59 years after the temple had been completed, but in reality, the real work was not done. The nation had fallen away from the teachings of the true and living God Most High, and many of their practices, even of the priests, was verging on idolatry. Ezra was one of the captives in Babylon, where, almost certainly, he was born. He was a lineal descendant of Israel's first high priest, Aaron, and also the links in the chain of descent are given in the volume of the sacred law, so that he was a high priest. Also, he was a scribe, a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which really means that he was an expert instructor in the scriptures. Apart from this, Ezra would never have become leader that he was. In his personal character, Ezra is a fine example. His godly purpose, his godly thankfulness for success, his prayerful dependence on God, his acute grief at the sin of the wrong, sin of the people, his prompt, brave action against that which was wrong, these aspects of Ezra's character really repay reflection. Note here, the return to Jerusalem was started with Zerubbabel and completed with Ezra 80 years later. Ezra's, Ezra's return was made possible by a decree of Artaxerxes, the then reigning Persian monarch, with about 2,000 males in all his contingent in 456 BC. Jewish tradition has made Ezra one of the most celebrated personages in all the history of his people. Five works are attributed to him. One, the founding of the so-called Great Synod, or Synod of Learned Jewish Scholars. Two, the settlement of the Sacred Canon, or recognized list of authoritative Hebrew Scriptures, and its threefold arrangement into the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. Three, the changeover from the writing of the Hebrew Scriptures in the Old Hebrew Script to the New, with its square Assyrian characters. 4. The compilation of the Book of Chronicles, along with the book which now bears his own name and the Book of Nehemiah. And 5. The institution of the local synagogues. If these five big accomplishments provenly and directly originated with Ezra, then he certainly is of a stature to be eyed with some wonder, but did they originate with him? This much, however, is quite factual, that these far-reaching developments took shape in or near the period of Ezra's moral and literary leadership, and that he had no small part in them. Nehemiah Nehemiah came to Jerusalem in 445 BC. The restored Jewish remnant had then been back in Judea over 90 years, Zerubbabel and his contemporaries were now passed away, and another generation filled their place. What had happened during those ninety years? The new temple had been built, much inferior to the original of course, but, although the actual building had taken only four years, five months and ten days after the arrival of Haggai and Zechariah, yet the remnant under Zerubbabel had been back twenty-one years when it was completed. Some sixty years after this, Ezra had come from Babylon to Jerusalem with his company of approximately 2,000, males only accounted. Moral and spiritual conditions in Judea were then far from satisfactory. Princes, rulers, priests, Levites, and people alike had largely intermarried with the surrounding idolatrous peoples, and, although not themselves worshipping idols, were thus conniving all idolatry and allowing its infiltration to the jeopardizing of the rising generation. Unchecked, such a fusion of the returned remnant with the outnumbering Gentiles then in Palestine would have meant complete absorption and obliteration of them as a distinct people, and we can well understand Ezra's consternation at discovering it. Maybe the laxity came about during the interval of government debility between the death of Zerubbabel and the advent of Ezra. The default, however, had been drastically corrected by Ezra, whose timely measure was accompanied by widespread penitence. Thus we see that Ezra really became the means of reserving the Hebrew race and restoring them to the worship of the true and living God Most High.
Under the leadership of Nehemiah, the walls of Jerusalem were rebuilt, and the people themselves were re-instructed in the law which God had given to their nation, long before, through Moses. Nehemiah's special objective was the rebuilding of the city walls. His work came under two headings. 1. The reconstructing of the city walls. 2. The reinstating of the people. Just how all this was done is a story in itself, but we have in this talk found that, though the temple itself was only 21 years in the rebuilding, from the arrival of Zerubbabel to the completion under the inspiration of Haggai, yet, from the destruction of King Solomon's temple and the city of Jerusalem by the armies of Nebuchadnezzar, to the restoration of the people to the true worship of God and the rebuilding of the city walls, was 140 years. And, during that time, we see the major part played by the three principles of the Holy Royal Arch Chapter, as well as Ezra and Nehemiah.